हेलो फ्रेंड्स स्टार्टिंग सून एंड अनमिसेबल लाइफ कवरेज योर ऑन सेलर टूडे टीवी You are watching Sailor Today TV, your unmissable dose of vitamin C. The sailor girl, what better it could be? Let me tell you, it's a badly merry zindagi. The end of night parties, karke masti aluti. Got my parents from her sikha discipline duty. I married the sailor girl, what the lagti hai beauty. Her uniform makes a gorgeous eyes, and she is a cutie. Oh yes, sailor girl, she's a sailor girl. Oh yes, Sailor Girl, she's the wonder. I married the Sailor Girl. She gets loads of money. Lifestyle hai better, penta Gucci or Armani. She works outside, I stay at home. Arrangement of money. Wo bani hai ka to mai bana hu uski ki. I married the sailor girl. She gets loads of money. We have the best of life. It is rosy and sunny. Oh yes, sailor girl. Oh yes, sailor girl. She's a sailor girl. Oh yeah, wonder girl. बदली मेरी जिंदगी शीज अ सेल गाल ओ ये सेल गाल शीज अ बंद गाल शीज अ सेल गाल to join me. The institute offers large range of services to its members. The present membership is over 18,000 and spread globally. The members are the top decision makers in the maritime and associated industries. The institute, to which membership and its office bearers, is playing an active role in the various maritime activities around the world. IMEI has taken several initiatives to provide high-quality seafarers to the industry. The Institute has teamed up with 
that a great jundal of shipping to implement ambitious start-based exams for the seafarers, which has been a grand success. I am EIH partner for the Institute of Marine Engineers Science and Technology London, also known as IMRESD. The IMRESD provides IMEI student members with full membership benefits of having access to the IMRESD library. The Institute has also constructed an air conditioned guest house for the members traveling to Goa. The Institute has also established itself as one of the pioneer training institutions for EG shipping approved training courses for seafarers for both preparatory and management level. IMDI Navi Mumbai is one of the very few training institutions which imparts simulator based training. The Institute has signed an MOU with Andhra University Vishakhapatnam for development of a state of the art center of excellence which shall have modern facilities to impart highest quality of training to marine engineers. The Institute is actively contributing to the cause of promoting the seafarers from India. To fulfill this commitment, IMEI has established facilitation centers. <coughs> facilitation centers provide various services to the seafarers for their certifications on behalf of Indian administration, such as certification of electrotechnical officer, dangerous cargo endorsements, watch keeping certificates, and certificate of proficiency for able seafarer engine. The institute has its registered office in Mumbai and branches Chennai, Delhi, Goa, Kochi, Kolkata with the chapter at Patna, Mumbai with the chapter at Navi Mumbai and Gujarat, Pune and Vishakhapatnam with a chapter at Hyderabad. IMEI is an active member of the prestigious World Maritime Technology Congress, which is an international body of 26 professional associations from global maritime industry. The Institute organizes four yearly events, such as International Maritime Conference and Exhibition in Marco at Mumbai, Marine Symposium at Chennai, and Global Maritime Seminar Lumars at Vishakhapatnam. IMEI's monthly journal, Marine Engineers Review, published since 1982, the members receive it free of cost. The Institute publishes a time feed, which are available at discounted price to the members. The Institute is an excellent forum for the marine engineers who deliberate various technical issues related to maritime field. The Institute has been actively participating at the forums within the country and outside for development of marine engineering. The Institute has been instrumental in providing world-class training to the seafarers, thus enabling them to meet the international challenges. IMEI aspires to produce seafarers who are enthusiastic, skilled, and technically abreast to accept and meet the life challenges with the best of potential. A little bit word from our sponsors. I am. I have made uh,
and uh, we have uh, completed two successful days today is the last one and uh, we are very optimistic uh, that everything will be till the end everything will be done in, in, in a successful way so the event uh, international shipping conference uh, jointly organized by imei and kolkata branch and cmi kolkata chapter on a theme of maritime sustainability global opportunities is a bet to our excellence an event like this is the first of its kind held in eastern india in today's page three topics are included these are safety in shipping it could be worthwhile to have by captain vidyut banerji the second one is security threats and impacts on maritime sustainability by sri pralay kumar bhattacharya and the last and the final one uh, in this session will be implementation of cyber risk management in shipyard by sri s renivas it's a well known that a series of maritime casualties have highlighted in the recent past and the drawbacks of many substandard vessels and shipping companies that is to say poor training and education in the manning of the vessels inadequate management both ashore on board this gets far this gets further aggravated when associated stakeholders do not cooperate with each other the easy conclusion was a lack of and at the same time the need for a quality management system in international shipping which uh, captain bidu banerji is likely to reflect so the investigation concluded by imo into the loss of herald of free enterprise the fire that broke out on scandinavian star in 1990 the considerable loss of human lives in the estonia accidents the organization the organization has sped up the application of the ism court the ism court uh, it has been going on for a long long time since 1998 we have just completed two decades of ism court still we find there are a lot of scopes for it to be improved by applying quality management system the ism court's primary aim was to establish international standard and uh, that standard is yet to be 100% uniform across the globe the court has not set any safety environment regulation but rather it lays down rules to ensure the existing regulations are complied with mainly the imo conventions such as marpol solas stcw in addition there is a close relation with the port state control mou requiring documentation monitoring and its applications through safety management system and of course issuance of doc document of compliance for the owning and operating companies in simple terms the principles set down by the court are a safety policy from top management to top management assured to the ship's officer and crew a creation that is a documentary evidence the effectiveness of this uh, policy as to be uh, the effectiveness of this policy in reality still needs to be improved otherwise the vessel will not be permitted to trade the compliance in mandatory regulation recommended guidelines existing with the shipping industries to some extent still needs to be improved captain bidud banerjee will be reflecting more on this and share his thoughts with us today now going to the next uh, title security threats and impact on maritime sustainability by sri prahlad bhattacharya a uh, prahlad bhattacharya maritime security uh, is one of the latest buzzword of the international relationship major actors maritime policy ocean governance international security have past decades started to include maritime security in their mandate or reframed their work in such terms in 2014 united kingdom the european union as well as the african union have launched the ambitious maritime security strategies the north atlantic treaty organization nato also included maritime security as one of its objective in the year 2011 alliance maritime strategy imo pioneered the development when launching the international maritime security policy in 
all the maritime safety committee also maritime safety committee included maritime security in their list of task but still there's a lot to improve with respect to the piracy and the safety of the seafarers the ships and the cargoes in numerous areas in the world maritime security is like international buzzwords is a team that draws attention to the new challenges rallies support tackling this so there is a scope for improvement the challenge how to tackle the piracy problems especially in the gulf of guinea area discuss on the maritime security frequently do so by pointing to threat that prevail in the maritime domain they refer to threats such as maritime interstate disputes like iran and other nations maritime terrorism piracy trafficking of narcotics especially in caribbean and gulf of mexico area people and illicit goods arms proliferations illegal fishing environmental crimes and marine accidents and disasters sri pralay kumar bhattacharya has included a lot of lot of his own experience hands on experience and his uh teaching parts uh, which he did in imu in a very interesting way that he will share with us today our next title is implementation of cyber risk management in shipyard by sri s srinivas uh to me it looks like uh, i have not actually gone through the uh the work he has done on this title but to me it looks like it's a starting point of the subject is the recognition of growing threats of cyber attack to commercial maritime constantly growing dependency on technologies has advantages on the other hand however it makes commercial maritime shipping and its service providers like shipbuilding yards across the globe progressively more and more vulnerable to cyber crime and that particularly affects the financial transactions most of the cyber crimes are <clears throat> are related to financial transactions and spying and just get to know how to what the other parties are doing the gps signal interference malware attacks even gaining control over the maintenance system of the network are on increase The main objective of the subject is to present and discuss the guidelines of cyber security of the shipyards including the best practices for implementation of the cyber risk management and we indeed look forward to know the insights that Sri Srinivas and Srinivas will share with us today thank you ladies and gentlemen i now um actually we wanted to uh, let me tell the audience that captain dn goswami is the chair session for this uh, session on uh, safety and security and we would like to introduce him also uh, watnaga sir please uh, uh, yes. though, though it got delayed but then nevertheless uh, uh, captain dev narayan goswami is a sailing master mariner and a research scholar at maastricht uh, school of management in netherlands uh he has commanded 42 ships so far his gross sea going experience is 39 years eh, almost four decades he is still a sailing master and has served in all type of tankers except on lng tankers he is also visiting lecturer of indian maritime university calcutta campus for a master business administration studies that is mba in international transport and logistics he also holds an mba degree in shipping and logistics from middlesex university in london and is a member of charter and management institute london in december 2016 he was awarded a post graduate diploma degree of research and methodology skills by maastricht school of management maastricht 
in may 19 uh, 2018 he was awarded an mphil degree by the same institute uh, uh with this uh, i would also like to uh, introduce the first speaker uh captain uh, vidyut kumar banerjee uh captain banerjee completed his pre c training from ts rajendra in 1981 and served with senior steam navigation company limited till 1988 thereafter served with many reputed companies like nyk bsm msc uh to serve on very large and modern ships at that time completed master uh, license in january 91 and got his first command in 1995 he, uh, he then he has got lot of feathers in his cap uh, the first certified ship of ism he had in 1995 itself in past 25 years a silver jubilee which he is celebrating now he has commanded modern and very large cellular container ships of his time the latest being almost 4 400 meter loa 23565 tu in 2019 after 35 command tenures calling over 1074 ports over 100 third party inspections his ever his ships never got delayed or had any detainable Uh, deficiency ever uh, there had been no cargo claims or weather damage or contact damage on board the ships which he had commanded no crew there is another feather no crew sustained injury to cause of any delay to ship or requiring hospitalization that is something very very commendable he has helped and mentored many of his younger team members to realize the true true potential and value of this great profession he uh, he is a qualified uh, lead auditor uh, i believe it is uh, qms lead auditor and he is registered as an independent director in the database of uh, but i could read out only few part of it uh i hand over to captain vidyut banerji thank you sir good morning to thank you sir good morning to everybody uh, am i audible yes, yes you are loud and clear okay uh, first of all i am very uh, grateful to isco and the organizing committee to give me this slot to share my, some of my experiences of uh, this wonderful and very fulfilling career at sea uh, spanning 40 years now 25 years as master i thank the idea that was floated by mr amit up and mr amit nagar in one of the meetings i also participated in in this isco was actually thought of why not have it in calcutta and there are so many uh, experienced seniors who have uh, shown us the way and we have followed part of their teachings to us mentoring that we got and i will now present my uh, case of, uh, where we are regarding the safety at sea so uh, are you able to see, uh, see, see this screen yeah yeah we can see now I need to see this. Yes, we can see it now. Yeah, yeah we can see it. I need to see it myself, so I have to reduce yours. Okay. So <clears throat> this is about safety in shipping. I have put it. It could be nice to have. That means we have a long way to go, or we are not where we wish to be. So this discussion is not based on information or experience of the present COVID nineteen situation. but for uh, from about two decades or more when we are operating in an ecosystem where the ships need to be compliant so when we discuss any topic it is either to celebrate an achievement or sharing of concerns when things are not going too well so i'm thinking that is the second part that i'm dealing with because we have to reach somewhere we wish to be 
Though shipping has expanded many folds, but the frequency of accidents, claims, injuries is rising all the time, year after year. So let us try to understand in simple terms where we really stand on this matter. Now, shipping is a business. It has to make profits and bring to better condition, financial condition, all the constituents. So all stakeholders must gain from it. Otherwise, it's pointless. And on the other hand, we also know in our personal lives, in our professional lives, that safety and quality always reduce cost of operations in the long run. That's why we buy a better model car or better equipment, because in the long run, it is cheaper. So now, to put it simply, good safety standards on a ship means less accidents or crew injury, reducing time loss and insurance claims, which means increase in deployment of the ships, increase in no claim bonus, that means reduction in premium, more earnings, and therefore, better financial condition for the ship owners, charters, operators. For the insurance companies, more profits also because there are not, uh, less claims to be paid out means better financial condition. But is it the case? Because everybody seems to be having a resource charge. So it's a reality that better financial condition is our goal, but we are not really reaching there. Why is it so? Like really how many shipping companies are in robust financial condition today? Uh, there are more companies which are going bankrupt or just you know, managing somehow rather than making a you know, great uh, business out of it. I sat down and I was thinking that uh, what are the accidents that we see today uh, on board around the ship? So this is a list of about 48 accidents. It took me about 10 to 15 minutes to just make this Excel sheet. This is not from the internet. This is what I read, what I gather in the news, uh, different circulation of the media and internal fleet circulations, experience sharing. So 48 kinds of accidents are happening all over the world on a daily basis here and there. So it is cargo, fire, man overboard, oil spill, injury to crew, collision with fishing boat. Uh, so this is uh, uh, amazing that uh, we are doing so much, so many people uh, having synergy, having such vast knowledge, but these are the accidents that are happening. And what is the statistics from the internet? This is from uh, fleetmon.com from the year 2017 to August 2020. Uh, there are more than two accidents per day. Of course, this is uh, including smaller vessels, uh, more than 100 GRT, but even major shipping accidents are quite a bit. I was uh, presenting one uh, uh, paper in January, I think 2018, and that was around 22nd January or so. And I just went into the net to check. And even then we had more than one accident per day, major accidents that are listed and is available in the media, uh, websites that uh, talk about night and casualties. So our background is what? That majority of the owners and managers are ISM, DOC, SMC compliant. We have elaborate systems. Some are also compliant with many other ISO standards of 14,000, 50,000, and many more. Every ship and shore office has but elaborate procedures, SMS in place, per, uh, the plan maintenance systems in place, very robust structure of regular reporting, monitoring, and structured auditing, adequate support and verification by the class, flag state, port state. So we have what we need to have to uh, have the regulations in place, to have the procedures in place. But how do you explain this repeated multiple failures across the board, no? leading to serious accidents that result in loss of life, loss of limbs, cargo, damage to ship structure, the ship is uh, going and hitting uh, cake, uh, the key cranes on the piers while birthing, unbirthing. Okay, year after year it is happening and we are discussing and where are we going actually? So are we missing the basics? Now, if you have a collision at sea, can you have a collision at sea if you follow call rigs? I think if you follow call rigs 100%, you cannot have a collision at sea because you are supposed to stop the vessel, uh, put the engine system, get more time, apprise yourself. So you cannot have an accident. So why is that the bridge teams are not following call rigs? What is keeping them distracted? This is a question to ask. That the basic call rigs we are not following and we are having collisions. Similarly, the PMS, if you follow with OEM spares, no equipment fails without giving warning. You know, there's a change in temperature, consumption, power consumption, or the noise, or the vibration. It gives uh, you an indication. 
Now you have a modern car. How many times does it fail? You send it to the workshop for regular maintenance as per the miles. They do the oil change, do the checking, and you are driving a car for four five years without a trouble. No no breakdown on the road. So why should a ship have a breakdown? I need to understand this. Accidents cannot happen. I have presented an elaborate paper on this. That in my belief, in my uh, understanding, accidents cannot happen. We allow them to happen, and then the Heinrich rule and all the unsafe conditions, unsafe acts come in, and we allow them, ignore them, and then therefore it goes to a major incident and an accident. Most root cause investigations can identify identify the significant contributing cause, but they always uh, bring it out and blame it on human error. They do not point out the system failures. What good is a root cause analysis if it cannot prevent an recurrence? Root cause analysis means to understand the situation better so that people can understand what went wrong, do the corrective action, prevent it from happening, and then go on with the job. We are on a shipping business, a maritime enterprise, or in, uh, you know, uh, we call it. But we are not in a casino that the cargo set out from one port may reach, then we are lucky. It's not so. We have to deliver on time. And I being in the container trade, we are delivering by the hour. So, where, which date? Six months down the line. What time I will be in which port? And we have been doing it for the last 25 years. Ships with design defects need to be rectified. This is a major problem because we are leaving ships with design defects, which has a possibility to play out in the next 20, 25 years, 30 years. Any time it can play out. So we are waiting to be surprised. Why? Now the aircraft uh, with the uh, navigation system or the operating system, the Max, they had to be grounded. Now, in the, if the airline industry can only let a aircraft uh, go into commercial operations with a defect like that, believe me, the shipping has got too many design defects. And when I am de taking delivery of the ship in the shipyard, uh, the class surveys they uh, are very apologetic and say they are helpless because somebody else will sign them. Their their paper instead, you know, the watertight doors don't close. You no, know, one man cannot close the watertight door, and it has been passed. The pilot ladder cannot be rigged. You know, the shipyard will use 15 people to rig a pilot ladder, so combination ladder. So I will say no. I have only two men. I have 15 minutes, so rig it in two with two men in 15 minutes. If you cannot do that, it is not acceptable. So this kind of rigid uh, standards is not written anywhere, but this is coming from our experience, from our good practices. So we have to put. A stop where things are going wrong. Defects need to be rectified properly. A temporary fix is never a solution. We know that. Now another very uh, wrong thing that we have got into is that the juniors and subordinates have learnt a lot of wrong things. Now how did they learn this? If they are observing the seniors always doing the right thing, no matter what. Okay. So how could they have learnt the wrong thing? That means we are demonstrating in front of our juniors, our subordinates. We are getting under pressure or whatever reasons that we are not doing the right things. So they have now learnt that it is okay, you know, to take the shortcut or not to do a job properly. Risk assessment and stop work work must be actually followed, not to become mere paper exercise. So this has to uh, do with the restoring the balance of the authority and responsibility of the personnel on board. It is very simple. As I say, if it something is simple, you can you know follow, ask others to follow. Because it should not be too much of a brainer to follow what is simple. To succeed, we just need to do what is right at the right time in the right way. And we know what is right. We have enough knowledge. We have enough experience to know what is right. So if it is so simple, why we are unable to do it? So can we put a finger on the reasons for embracing this erroneous work culture in such a widespread manner across widespread spectrum of operators and st other stakeholders? How can so many people be doing uh, things that are wrong? Because an accident is not a contributory factor or caused by one person, the situation, the circumstances, inputs of very many uh, people who want to make an accident. Now, the safety in shipping, the mirror of the human values, deteriorating, deteriorating safety standard in shipping is aligned to the changing mindset of humans. Loss of empathy, increasing disparity, reduced transparency, and high stress levels are everywhere. now we, i am getting out of the shipping industry to talk about humans so the what the humans are having or uh, generating in the society in their other uh, work environment that is also reflected in shipping that is what i am coming to what we think to be fair task benefits liberty authority while receiving does not seem to be so while we are giving or sharing brands and quality 
are of very different for personal use and what we supply on the unmistakable disconnect between the intent what we promise and what we deliver and this has become such a nature that we have created formal tools and training to cover up this gap by clever tactics let me give you some examples you see when they increase the uh, price of a package they will keep the uh, price same and the quantity will be or something is not so good they will put a you know nice packaging on top and then they sell it and data about statistics whichever is inconvenient we discard that data so goals are shifted as and when convenient so we are going in for comfort rather than what is right now the response of who from the time the pandemic broke out there were so many you know versions so many information so everybody has their opinion but do we think that who was very upfront in giving the information that was required to understand the risk from this pandemic A virus medical research is funded so that the results help in the business of the pharma industry so little white lies okay in our dealing here and there similarly our justice system are they careful that this the process is delayed the litigants what is the effect of this delay on the lives of the litigants we are heavily engaged in processes but the purpose is forgotten so we say justice delayed is justice denied it's not my words but it is happening day in day out as yesterday we were speaking the action or the mistake happens in over a short period of time but it takes years to get you know it resolved in the courts so how do we justify this continuous without the purpose being achieved so many iso 9035 businesses go bankrupt how you are in perfect uh, condition of operations you have procedures in place you are in checks in place how did Similarly, ICRA crisis-related financial institutions have failed defaults in payments. What is the point of a certification if the value underneath is uh, fictitious? It is uh, doubtful. But then such thing happens: company go bankrupt or the payment default happens. What is the penalty on the classification society or the ICRA, the crisis who have given this certification? Okay, Satyam was a case uh, in point that in our financial. Uh, is to uh, uh, eco sphere that uh, we can recall this insulation from consequences of all the actions allow the brief party so today somehow the cunning wins overall so i'm sorry to be so direct but the point is that at sea we are losing lives and it is not acceptable that doing a normal routine operation we lose lives you see the whole uh, spectrum of birds animals when they go about their way for living lives doing the routines of you know foraging and eating and surviving and procreating they don't die because of risk they do the risk assessment themselves so why should humans die on while working on board ships that's a routine how can you have a you know possibility of a loss <laughs> ship management budget mostly is not sufficient so most of the ships are already over budget by the second or third quarter so because we want to have quantity over quality majority of ship management companies routinely violate their sms now whenever it becomes inconvenient we say okay is baat chalta hai so we will be careful next time but we must go on volkswagen top management emission data we know about it so we are making promises which we know we cannot deliver is it by design now we have uh, key workers uh, designation for the seafarers what about the crew change in 7 months no standardization who will answer to these things they have international day of seafarers since 2001 one the uh, world trade center attack ship to liberty and surely has been trampled upon and curtailed without justification for years 2001 to 2020 19 years anybody bothered we had mlc in between seafarers don't get surely for sure but life goes on so due to this deterioration in human ethics and values we have significant personal gains making significant personal gains has become so much of a priority that no industry has been able to insulate themselves so similar is the case with the shipping we are not able to insulate ourselves from the personal gains rather than the common for ships and seafarers this new set of human values response standards are manageable in human to human interface because you outsmart each other it's fine but it cannot cope up in human to nature interface where shipping mostly operates the impact and consequences for interaction with nature's forces cannot be mitigated by wishful thinking 
or negotiations in a negotiations in a company board room what could be termed as a blunder in a human interaction would manifest as a catastrophe in a interface of hum- with the nature because every existing force there is of a higher dimension like i am on a container ship the minimum weight of an empty container is 2 and a half tons okay 20 feet here and size i have no fixture on board the ship to handle it, even an empty container forget about a full container so i cannot have the situation where my crew need to handle a container so i must be fully secured for sea before i leave port no matter what so there i have to take a stand if my ship is not ready for sea the chief officer does not even give the one hour notice to the union so once he is of course initially lot of people you know uh, will have a objection to it why delay this and why delay that but when the ship takes the cargo and reaches the destination well then that is the time everybody realized that it is worth it to have it after 25 years of operation which was listed there <coughs> some disturbance coming in. so i i am just suggesting because i operated the last 25 years in the same ecosystem same regulations same ports and 174 port nearly 2000 many rings so how do it we manage we have to give the power to the crew because they are the ones who are doing the job a ship must operate by best practices of merchant seamen ism code inculcated what we had by that time the best practices ism code did not do any self learning collated from different companies different best practices and made this code the procedure okay does ism code by itself create any best practice that is my question management policy vision mission statements are very elaborate so we follow them we stick to them because it is took lot of thought process to make these policies and uh, you know procedures safety standards need absolute commitment they cannot work as per convenience a ship operating safely on schedule this particular one sentence you know which i have followed all my life this serves every stakeholder's purpose if a ship is operating safely on schedule that means it has got no damage no delay no other breakdowns no crew injuries so they don't need you so owners charters everybody is you know stakeholders uh, purpose is solved with only the ship operates safely on schedule the ism code was imposed from outside as you know to for the cause of the port state because of the rogue ship owners were leaving the ships with a burden to the port state so but the ism code has been uh, through imo only been giving directives to ships and ship owners and ships crew it does not give any uh, uh, for mandatory requirement to any port that means ports can call ships big ships with no arrangement for uh, big size mm-hmm. arrangement for big exposure at birth the gangways uh, most container ships have gangways about 78 steps gangway which go across working cargo way that means you have got a container of 20 tons of 30 tons or 25 tons video video but video so we are violating safety ha no consideration sab sab communication uh if i tell you i think i think uh, one minute captain uh, bindu uh, just want to, i think we need to we need to being good yeah we need to yeah we need to tell the uh, attending members uh, that to keep the uh, somebody system. can mute it yeah babu tumhe the oral pass kore se hoy to get thank guys baba ne tumhe ekta message diye bole to baba ka to mujhe dekhiye chobita wo banar ki ta prank voice ko log ki principal ji na bole je bol la college principal ji bol la college college I, I don't know one wait one wait we will we, we'll, we'll get it i i know from uh, where it is coming just hold on a second kitcha robin goshami to amader barite prochur please go ahead i have muted him okay yeah, okay yeah, thanks so so we are uh, breaking safety uh, requirements uh, when it ever it is convenient or we have no solution to it uh, this marpole waste reception you know we have now gone into the scrubber but how many ports have got the reception facility for sludge similarly we have the narcotics you know it's a big headache anywhere in the world trying to uh, dispose of this expired narcotics so 
we are having on one side regulations for ship owners ships and ships crew but there is nothing for the ports they can start business fully loaded bulk carriers cross the north bar of the amazon river with zero ukc this is uh, i made some trips so i know many people know this so where is the sms that time each large ship master doing a swiss canal transit because of the limit line arrival and the sequence in the convoy has a tower violation without exception and it's a challenge anybody says no they we have uh, mitigated this somehow so we are accepting uh, these kind of uh, breaks you know in our safety understanding compliance as per convenience ism procedure suspended whenever situation becomes in i believe ism code has shackled ships to and shipping companies to minimum standards in every aspect minimum standards can ensure survival where shipping is now we are surviving but it's not allowed to contri- or contribute towards pursuit of excellence shipping is just surviving today it cannot flourish ism uh, code came in much later in shipping it's only 25 years ism code has come in good practices were built over decades you know there are companies which are were there 175 years old rickmus i was working for them their old whole sms was 72 pages So I asked my DPS sir, uh, I am coming from NYK. We had nine manuals of SMS. Why you have only seventy-two pages of this one manual? He said, "We trust and believe that we have put qualified seafarers on board. They don't need our instructions." Now this was as late as two thousand ten. Okay, two thousand ten and two thousand thirteen. We had a change in management in Rikmas. We brought in an IMS integrated management system with elaborate manuals. Today the company is bankrupt. I knowledge comes from practice and action later documented into books and manuals ships cannot be operated like railways riding on rigid tracks set on the ground because a standardized system like ism it is trying to bet, put a base the ships don't have a base old ships new ships different trade different routes different sizes different crew training you don't have a standard base so you need human intervention like we had covid and the crew were changed, traveling through the interstate and one pass from one uh, state government was not accepted by the another state so the personnel were getting stuck on the border and then somebody who broke all norms of the uh, indian uh, uh, government systems put in personal touch from mmd and made things happen so shipping is a dynamic environment which needs the innovation of human beings it needs the excellence of individuals to to adapt to the situation demands and deliver two jewels that i am i still initiated us in shipping was zero defects and doing it right the first time and every time where are those now we have forgotten about zero defects we don't talk about zero defects why not present mindset and practice have curtailed the onboard decision making abilities some may agree some may disagree but it has curtailed attributes of human innovation courage common sense resilience has affected too many approvals required i have to anchor a sh- uh, ship in certain pale place of waiting i have to take office approval i asked the office how do you know what is the position position uh, situation and the position when i come into anchor suppose some ship is already taken that position then what do i do i wake you up again to ask where should i anchor what is happening too many people need to be kept pleased feeling of professional pride passion courage once abandoned are diminished the sense of belongingness has killed the pursuit of excellence crew are having contract system four months here and i don't know where i am going to be so we are got a system which is become bigger bigger than anybody nobody can challenge the system today because the system has put too many you know curtails checks and balances that nobody feels the ship system are not tailor made one size does not fit all it just like buying a shirt uh, in a sale because it was cheap and then trying to fit the body inside that shirt it does not work that way regulation and systems have to remain helpful not a headache for seafarers big names of shipping glory were companies with best practices and safety cultures developed over in house developed in house over several decades safety quality efficiency and excellence are not necessarily dependent on printed manuals the essence of ism could not be captured in most sms manuals to keep it simple and relevant so what was this sms and ism talking about say what you will you will do so it was much better not to say too much because every company sms manual is a contradiction itself means you don't have to do any survey you don't have a ship around i can find your contradiction in your own sms because you say something one place and you don't have the resources to do that 
do as you have said and then document it it was very simple but if you have made a mess in the first line that where you should have not said too much and it is very difficult to rectify it or correct the situation the step three of documenting it increase information issues focus this is a modern management malady you know too many people have a say in the matter who maybe don't understand we have got the concept of macro management and taking a holistic view so don't fix anything that ain't broken so we have breakdown prevention is better than cure is in the books only in the training only doing time on task now is redundant stitch in time saves nine very old adage so we keep some excuses ready why we could not do it you know giving excuses has now become a normal way of life humans lie more often now more importance is given to remain likable and being effective pms duties are not done sometimes it's just done on papers the spares are not received so what the engineers or you know people on board will do but then the record should be nice you know benjamin franklin said all for the want of a horseshoe lay the bottle was lost you can see what it the whole uh, narration of this is but small thing so ships have to run micro management you have to know each bolt has to be tight each valve has to be proper each equipment has to be proper parameter just because ship is carrying the cargo from port to other everything is fine it is not so because today it's doing so but tomorrow it will break down how can we explain so many equipment failures happening so often since our action today generate more problems than solution brushing them under the carpet seems to be the only solution because we'll see tomorrow we'll know, later handle it later that's how it goes we have a uh, communication we have discussion we have knowledge banks we have experts we are doing what is required everybody in the progress you know like uh, the crew changes also everything is in progress but where is the solution yesterday our uh, uh, dr rajendra uh, saxena of solari maritime said that we are not getting the you know uh, solution to the uh, situations despite our so much of knowledge there is no word dirt of knowledge experts are there for everything paralysis in decision making is very common today we want to be 100% sure of everything to avoid any embarrassing situation or question being raised going forward this is not only with shipping this is all over everywhere in human wherever interface is there we have got into this kind of a status quo that let us be safe then sorry uh i know energy if you can yeah. sum up please yeah uh, there is yes. a small uh, thing a uh, pareto principle that means 20% of our efforts take the uh, lead to the 80% of the benefits or the outcome so we uh, are doing maybe 20 80% of the targets we are achieving but this 20% maybe we are not attending to and this 20% of the issues are going to are leading to the 80% of the headaches of accidents and you know the deviations of from our targets so we need to pull our socks and go back to the zero defects so we need to follow our sops protocols don't invite surprise okay we need uh, to inculcate the practice of time required to do any routine task on board a small task takes time so if we add up the time into number of equipment like fire extinguisher charging or recharging or safety equipment we will find that there is not enough time to do the job so the job will never be done the crew food supply is pegged to a dollar not to the nutrition value or the cal calorific value and yet we want to say that we are one how come the food of the crew is not as per what the human needs but it is pegged to a dollar value so for the long term says we need to put service before self we take more, should take responsibility before looking for the rewards this shipping has been rewarding enough but only for other children why it is not good enough for my children we need to answer these questions because it is good and safe then why not everybody willing to join it only people who don't know about shipping they have been guided to the tmis to uh, join shipping these are the things to answer anyway it's a very very uh, long uh, or rather uh, chat i will close it now so there are certain things i would like to add which small solutions port can be restricted by time these are all there in the article so people can read it up okay the ports which are putting contraband or uh, the uh, stowage on board they are not getting any penalty so it is not the ecosystem is not balanced for the ships to remain compliant it's one sided for the ships to you know somehow manage and it, it is very stressful because 
you just cannot manage if the other side of the ecosystem is not even aware of what you need to do the rest our safe manning all this will remain uh, uh, kind the of same yeah uh tag power requirement there are many things you can read up the article and you will get and so that is it quality Thank cannot you. be applied selective selectively so i will conclude now though the time was not enough but anyway safety doesn't happen by accident it is much easier to succeed when one works for the well-being of others thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very much captain vidyut benerji uh, it was a wonderful paper and we appreciate the ideas and i am sure uh, the captains of the shipping companies are taking care of this now uh, i am sorry uh, <laughs> uh, captain goswami I, i we need to move ahead fast so i will just share the next uh, speaker's uh, cv with everyone here uh, it is pleasure to introduce uh, mr pralay kumar bhattacharya who is uh, bsc from st xavier's college calcutta uh, in the year 1964 and mba in transport management in 99 uh, from annamalai university where he was silver medalist uh, in uh, he was also silver medalist in uh, post graduate certificate course in international market from uh, cap xil uh, government of india uh, he is dmet 64 to 68 batch uh, he obtained his uh, first class motor certificate from government of india in 1973 he has got uh, memberships uh, as charter engineer Uh, fellow of institution of engineers fellow institute of marine engineers india and he is also a lead auditor uh, for so many standards uh, 9001 9, uh, 14001 45001 he has sailed on board for 18 years uh, with valum then uh, he was senior executive engineer uh, with mumbai port trust senior faculty with dmet uh, earlier dmet and now imu kolkata he has been 20 years as trainer consultant and auditor uh, of various management systems as i said uh, he has provided awareness training on isps uh, code to paradeep port personnel uh, on self developed Uh, course material he has also written a book on sso uh, which is being conducted uh, the course which is being conducted at imu kolkata uh, he is presently involved in audit consultancy and training on quality management environment management and occupational health and safety management and he is a mentor to the students of imu kolkata uh, without wasting any further time Uh, may i request uh, uh, mr bhattacharya to uh, present his paper please thank you mr bhatnagar <laughs> for your introduction it was not brief uh, i don't know whether i deserve such thing first of all i like to thank the, the management and the technical committee of isco for selecting my paper and giving me this opportunity to share my experience and thoughts with respect to the security of the ship which i have experience on board the ship as a chief engineer and uh, i know how this security uh, has been you know denting the in, in the income of the shipping company and uh, reducing the uh, sustainability of a ship uh, ship owner or the ship management company i can i share my screen yeah please sir one small request if you can stick to the timings yes sir yes ah, we are running out of time actually
Can every can you hear me? Everybody can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, sir. Now we all know that uh, uh, the ships of the maritime sector has been uh, <clears throat> facing these security threats from piracy, armed robbery, stowaways, drug and illegal arms smuggling, and these threats have been. causing the ship owners or the ship management company the financial loss of billions of dollars every year and uh, it has got because of this uh, loss definitely it has negative impact on the sustainability of the shipping business and and these losses are most of the time very high and uncertain uncertain and based on the global study the loss due to security threat amounts to 7 to 12 billion per year now security threats as i i have defined is the maritime security threats refer to damage harm caused to a vessel its cargo people on board vessel and the support system namely the port its infrastructure and personnel but there are the people we need to know the the legal definition as per imo uh, which is uh, i have given a reference that unclaws has defined the piracy similarly fal has defined the uh, armed ro robbery imo has defined armed robbery also in their resolution 1025 and the fal has defined stowaways this legal different definition is only to take legal action if uh, these people are caught on to be handed over to the authority the piracy can be traced to back to 16th century maybe earlier but it surfaced in 19th century in various areas of operation with ad equipped with advanced technology weapons pirates now that taking uh, they have taken a different uh, you know path they have taken the seafarer the hostage and uh, earning huge ransom money apart from the the cargo of the ship and sometimes the ship vessel itself recently they have claimed 9.5 million dollars from a ship owner armed robbery we know very similar to the piracy but these people mostly board the vessel with arms and the with the aim to uh, take away the expensive cargo and the ship spares metal spares spares etc stowaways are norm normal intentions is to take free ride hiding in them in the vessel but this stowaways sometime can be uh, dangerous because uh, now in the many a times recently it is happening the stowaways are in a group now how do we know that they are not terrorist and uh, maybe they will be supplied or they have hidden their arms somewhere so this uh, the stowaways also take, uh, taking away money from the ship owners with the financial loss of their landing cost then we know the masters are very well known about it that they the ship people have to take care of the stowaway till they are landed ashore that, that's that's the rule and if anything happens then the the vessel or the master will be pulled up the smuggling of the arms again that is also a security threats arms illegal drugs etc security threats and many a times i have experienced the ship people they get involved in it despite our present uh, regulation with respect to the uh, recruitment of the crew you know uh, uh, the screening through the uh, this uh, system but what happened when you go on board the people get in uh, attracted by the money offered by these people and they get involved in this act 
ultimately the sheep owners suffer now the i have analyzed some impact which can be uh, seen there that piracy that what are the tangible impact ransom money cargo loss loss of vessel enhanced insurance cost preventive action cost hire, like hiring person armed personnel support of naval ship used of uh, barb fence etc etc but there are indirect losses business loss due to the detained vessel hike in the operating cost and the social impact the trauma of the seafarer due to threats confined and fear of death economic disaster of the family of injured or the dead seafarers similarly armed robbers robbery also has got the direct impact where the the loss of cargo or uh, uh, expensive cargo and let me tell you because of this uh, we are the shipping has not been able to uh, stop this uh, uh, armed robbery successfully the the shipping has already lost if you uh, keep a track of the international trade shipping has already lost high value cargo trading to the aviation industry it is, uh, any ship owner or the ship manager will know that the high value cargo uh, which are not uh, he very heavy weight and who knows tomorrow aviation with a larger uh, aircraft may take away further more business from the shipping that is my observation so stow away also the legal expenses landing cost of the stow away vessel diversion cost retention higher insurance cost now i i am uh, showing the audience some global statistics that's to see that what happened between uh, 2015 and 2019 the this is mainly to uh, to highlight the areas of this piracy and the armed robberies not to the numbers you can we can see the numbers also but it is main main my main objective is to see the areas to refer to the areas where these thing happening and you will be surprised that if across atlantic there is nothing that there is nothing when you are crossing europe to usa or this thing why you have to think the world has to think why there is nothing why it is in this this continent only that is a, that that this is a picture of the uh, armed robbery and the piracy that studied by the organization and the types of the vessel they they that means these are the vessel the more attractive to them the which they find lucrative for the cargo for the uh, for uh, and then ransom money is also there this is the area 71% of the attack at the total 38 incidents in 1st january to 31st march uh it was you can see that the maximum area was in nigeria and then followed by venezuela china ghana indonesia according to the one earth uh earth they have created a comprehensive study the foundation maritime security threats have been costing international economy 7 to 12 billion per year and they have established this through their research study on the maritime security threats and i have highlighted this to make the of my audience are uh, aware of it and then i will see that what are the actions can be taken or is presently taken or can be taken as i have proposed cost of piracy is the following cost detention of the vessel the vessel detention held charter rate is 550000 us dollar per day and owner cost for 60 days you can calculate straight away that what is the 
then the average ransom money average ransom money in 2009 it was cost of ransom 179 to uh, 2010 it increased to 238 million and in 2019 the payment highest payment i don't have the uh, uh, so far the 2020 it is 9.5 million uh, dollars then there are excess insurance cost because the ship owners have to pass through those high risk area which are dangerous for uh, piracy and arm robbery and that definitely the insurance cost is going to be higher and that is also approximately was 3.6 billion us dollar in 2009 and 10 cost of rerouting the vessel rerouting the vessel also has got the uh, cost because of this armed robbery and the piracy threats and the cost of somali piracy ransom and then oh, i am going back sorry estimated uh, uh, rerouting cost is here and uh, 300000 dead weight vlcc is uh cost if the 10% ships are rerouted it can be 2.34 billion additional cost are hiring service from the security personnel and agencies and the charges were total of 3.6 billion in 2010 naval support 2.2 billion in 2010 prosecution cost 31 million 2010 cost of payment of anticipatory agency and trust fund that was created for, uh, to uh, support the uh, countries to uh, of the shipping against the piracy and the armed robbery and that fund that cost also 24.5 million the indirect cost as loss of regional trade runs into few hundred million dollars cost of stowaway we can see the 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 cost of stowaway in it is it depends on the the number of the stowaways and it, slowly the 2017 if you see the incidents in reduced but the number has increased and that is what is happening today and uh, uh, it is becoming more dangerous for the seafarers life than when they are in a group cost of illegal smuggling that that also is a fines penalty imposed by the customs loss of higher charter money legal expenses annual such cost uh is few billion dollars apart from i've mentioned common security threats maritime sectors have few more unseen security threats namely the interstate conflict like the, uh, the war broke out between uh, iraq and iran and it continued and the uh, ships are uh, carrying the cargo from, from these countries were under tremendous uh security threats means seafarers where their life is at the stake and the ship owners uh, they they also know when uh, uh, i mean they were marking time 
where when what will happen to the ship sir request to conclude uh... yes sir so the sustainability we know the economic issue environment is a social issues economic issues are the key parameter the sustainability because uh, as the seafarer shipping company or we have to take care of the environmental and and the social issues through certain rules and regulation uh, even in the port sector we have got the uh, dock workers welfare and safety rules but the economic issue the the that that is the, the international uh, uh, market is the shipping market is all is all volatile because of this area of operation the high risk the the sea but the this additional security threats have become the the more burden on the shipping companies and they they are they have re reduced the sustainability of the shipping and grossly affecting the sustainability of the shipping extra costs are incurred yes so oh. extra costs incurred automatically it will uh, reduce the sustainability now the there are many existing rules and regulations are there but my point uh, what i have experienced that these existing rules and regulations are not being followed by the states uh, stakeholders that means the sta states where the ships are passing or ships are docked and anchored they are not following it and the ultimate loss is the to the ship owners and the threat to the life of the ship owners thank you thank you sir for such thank a nice you. presentation with the permission of the uh, session chair i would like to introduce uh, our next speaker uh, last speaker but not the least uh, mr r shrinivas who is working as vice president and senior principal surveyor at indian register of shipping mr shrinivas specializes in control and automation systems system integration maritime cyber risk management and failure mode effect analysis he has got more than 37 years of experience he has spent 13 years in ship building and was in charge of installation commissioning testing of electrical control automation navigation and communication systems on board he has spent another 12 years in ship design as, and was involved in preparation of class drawings production drawing and also headed various consultancy projects for shipyards and ports in automation networking and vtms he is with irs for more than 12 years and presently heading the electrical and control system department in irs plan approval division he is irs member in uh, ix cyber system panel and joint industry working group on cyber systems uh, without wasting any further time uh, may i request mr r shrinivas to come and present his paper thank you mr patnagar and uh, am i audible yes, yes sir you are loud and clear <clears throat> sir thank you chair for the giving me opportunity to speak so let, without wasting the time let me just start sharing my screen you can see the screen okay uh, we are doing, you are able to see in the uh, presentation mode yes sir we can see it so one second thanks to the organizers and the chair and the mr patnagar and this is a, a short presentation on implementation of cyber risk management in shipyards the first two speakers have given us the problems the issues we have what we generally face on board and since unless the product is designed and delivered we cannot operate in a way which all of us want to operate especially people who are on board 
who are risking their lives and time to sail. So that's the idea of the theme to start with the cyber risk management in the shipyard itself. Cyber systems, as we know, the basically the computer-based systems are being used extensively in the ship, maybe for power generation, propulsion, steering, navigation, communication, and in the yards, extensively for the yard cranes, yard computer systems, plate cutting machines, and many other places, and for a lot of business communications. I'm trying to look at the processes in the shipyard in a two ways. First is the development of the product itself. That from the start from design phase. So we have now from earlier from the drawing board. Now we have come to the AutoCADs and computer-based systems for doing the designs. So from design stage to production, plate plate cutting, production block everywhere, cyber systems are used. Many times is nowadays. You are using standard software, maybe Tribon, AutoCAD for ship designs, and similarly, you have got computer steel cutting machines. And there are processes for the yard, like finance, stores, maintenance, marketing. So when we talk about a cyber security point of view from a yard perspective, we need to look at the both the processes. And because one unique thing in shipyard, what I would say is the product. Not only they have to make the product, but a lot of cyber systems are going into the ship itself. Unless due care, due vigilance is taken care at the beginning, the design stage, the product itself may have a issue with the cyber issues. I can recollect uh, the first speaker, Mr. Bhattacharya, when he says, when we have uh, issues with the watertight doors. Which everyone has been using day in day out in the last decades, many decades, and shipyards sometimes express the inability, helplessness because it is made by third party. Imagine a cyber system, a computer engine control system, where the hardware is made by one party, software by some other party, and someone else is integrating it. And if they are not done in a proper way, and the shipyard doesn't take a due care, and have implemented the systems in the place, you will have issues later in the ships. A representative process in the shipyard. I'm not saying it's exactly the same everywhere, but as we all know, most of us, I mean, when we have visited shipyard or we have taken our ships or working in the shipyard, it starts with engineering phase, purchase, stores, and various outfit shops, maybe pipe shop, machine shop, carpentry, sheet metal. And when we do the advanced outfitting, some of the inputs we take to the block stage and directly with on board itself. And we have support services, and the last, the bottom one, what we say, administration. These are the processes and sub-processes in a shipyard. Now the idea is to integrate the whole the processes. And when we talk about processes, there is a lot of data, and shipyard constantly interacts with the various stakeholders and shares the this data. Maybe classification societies. Authorities, subcontractors, ship owners, equipment suppliers, design companies, which is external to the shipyard, and internally you have the departments of finance, logistics, production, payrolls, project planning. So everywhere there is a data exchange between all these stakeholders. And earlier, this data used to be physical data, maybe papers. We we are talking quite some time back, maybe four, five to five decades before the physical data, non-digital process. So only we had standalone computer systems. The information was generated in the computer and transferred across. If you remember, way back when we used to have a floppy disk, which no longer exists now, not even the CD disk now. Information used to get transferred using the floppy disk, and then came internet. And we have internet, where the yard, the design office was able to transfer the information to the mail or file transfer. Now we are talking about real-time information sharing, not only within the yard but to the external people also. So this is how the data has evolved over the years. 
So last we have seen the processes. There are so many stakeholders who are uh, you are uh, getting benefit of the data sharing, and this how the data has been flowing over the years. Now when we talk about real time sharing and sharing instantly, there are few many technologies which come into picture. The first and foremost is networking. It has become very fast compared to earlier networks, very very slow networks. The networks have become very fast. So also internet, what the speed which we have we had some two three decades back, and what the speed we have is incomparable. We talk about integration of the systems, data management, because when there is lot of data, which is flowing around the shipyards and out of the shipyard to and fro, the management of data becomes very important. Many places we use AI, artificial intelligence systems, and for designs, there is a digital twin concept coming in. And when all these issues of digital systems or cyber systems are in use, the cyber risk management becomes of a paramount importance to the whole process. The about technologies generally we have come as uh, Industry 4.0. I will not much go into that because there is a paper yesterday, I believe. So I will not just touch up. The industry 4.0 is nothing but the four generations. We can say how the technology has evolved from mechanical system to mass production 2.0, automation controls in the three, and finally to industry 4.0, where you have got cyber physical systems and IOTs and networks. These are technologies which the new concept, the new buzzword is shipyard 4.0. Translated for Industry 4.0, where we use all the technologies which were discussed in the last slide, like cloud computing, cyber security, robotics, IoTs, RFID. RFID is nothing but a, when you are trying to transfer the information through wireless means and 3D printing. And why we do this? Why do you have all these things? To improve the process of shipbuilding, the advanced technologies used for simulations for new ship designs, and the data developed is used for decision support systems. Develop vessels with advancing autonomy. This is what the digital systems are being used nowadays. And of course, for surface and certification, which shipyard has to offer to the various class and flag societies, like administration rather. The new Technologies gives us a lot of advantages. To sum up, few like definitely productivity is increased. It's a cost efficient. We have secure storage, data sharing, decision supports, integrated prison processes, and ease in information access. A platform for feedback and improvement. Stay competitive in business. Business competition does not just end with doing a right thing quickly and efficiently. We also have to adopt the new technologies to stay competitive. Depends on the demand of the users. Now the demand of the user, the shipping companies, ship owners want to ship with advanced autonomy, advanced control systems. The shipyard has to gear up internally and train themselves. To produce ships of that kind. That's why I want to elaborate further because the use of computable systems for onboard application is on right. The ship also we see LDA we used to have standalone systems. Now slowly they are getting integrated. The, the best example is the TP system where you are inter integrating right from steering gear, controls, engine controls, thrusters, all together. And we are talking about remote maintenance. There are some OEMs who are can do some troubleshooting for the remote maintenance. Even DP operators, DP OEMs are doing that. Shipping companies want to do a performance monitoring in the back office and condition monitoring. Systems of different type of protocols and networks are integrated. You have one system made by one manufacturer with one. Protocol and another system with another manufacturer another protocol. The challenge is to integrate these two systems. Who does this integration? The shipyard. So why I'm though the project is about topic is about shipyard. Why I'm emphasizing on the ship is when so much technology is going in the ship. 
and the design and implementation integration becomes very very important unless the shipyard has a personnel who are trained and having advocate knowledge things don't work in fact imo in their interim guidelines for cyber security management says the vulnerabilities can arise because of inadequate design and integration there is one of the words that they have used in the short interim guide, guidelines on cyber risk management very clearly they say so it is very important the shipyard has the personal with knowledge and experience on the networks and cyber security so that the end product which is delivered meets the intended purpose fine so everyone wants the information very fast things to be integrated so we have a lot of integration lot of distillation but no new technology comes with some package one the thing is a cyber attack why does how does a cyber attack happen if you really look at it why we didn't have this kind of issues in the way back in 70s and 80s because where we had a normal electrical systems which can never be hacked they can go wrong they don't maybe because of uh, environmental issues or they may fail but someone cannot go and modify electrical relay someone cannot go and modify a diode or transistor but when the cyber systems are coming the whole control logic is developed through software if you remember age old days when we open a compressor panel you would have a huge set of relays to make up the logic that is auto start auto off stand by start stand by stop all the logic was built using lot of relays so nothing can go wrong there when if it is commissioned properly but if the same logic is built through software and someone has their access to the software then definitely if it can be modified then it can behave in a different way than it is intended to be that's why the issue of cyber has come in now not because not 40 years back and there could be two threats there can be external threat or internal threat external threat is when you have a system which can be accessed from the outside is external internal it is mainly unintentional a person really doesn't know that suppose you have a, i have a laptop here now it has a usb drive if you plug in the usb drive usb stick which is infected then i have i can transfer all the malware or the viruses from the stick to the laptop it may happen a ship also there is a common practice many times we see people trying to charge the mobiles to the drives usb drives unknowingly they transfer any virus in the mobiles to the system these are generally unintentional very rare case it could be when a person wants to do it but let us not talk about it it is only unintentional but external threats as yes, they are intentional they have a motive behind it and because either they want to hack the ship or divert the ship or maybe pirates or maybe some business advantage and similarly when it come to shipyards these attacks can be for business point of view can be steal the designs and there are many causes for that a typical control system and network system where systems are at different levels are there at the bottom most level you see a controllers which are actually doing the function and slowly as go up you go up to the office or corporate network which talks outside and that means if you see the red lines we are creating a path from external source to the internet like you got to see the cloud at the top which can come up to the local plc this external path if you extend down below if you can see there is a upon level up infected usb keys if they are inserted there is a definitely a cause for cyber attack so these are two types of attack we just discussed internal because of usb keys external because of insecure gateways and firewalls so outsider can easily come in and infect our systems and what are the consequences you know many of us know few things but from shipyard perspective definitely the loss of intellectual data loss of sensitive data the quotations gender specifications the legal contracts 
financial and one can always if possible can go and affect the operating systems also in fact the guidelines on uh, imo guidelines brings out two types of technologies in their specification they say information technology and operation technology operation technologies if you ship most of us from ship side we can say engine control system boiler control system or operation technology where a data is used to physically move or operate a system a steering gear whereas uh, when the data is used to generate reports it is information which we use day in day out in office spaces let us talk about cnc machine in the shipyard if someone is taking a software or the drawing design plate cutting design and fits it locally into the machine then a thread path is only from the local to the machine if it has got a usb drive as i can go and infect it but the same machine is connected to the design office so the design department can send the drawings online to the machine then the thread path is increased now you are able to access the machine from the design office also let us look at one more scenario the design office is on land which can communicate to the outside world that means i have created a path from the outside the shipyard to come into and land it in the design office land from there go up to the cnc machine is how the path gets created unless we have certain blocks barricades what we call typically firewalls the gateways in between you are always an easy path from it any person outside the yard to come right up to the place where he can do a lot of damage so when you talk about cyber risk management the first thing is what is the risk it is extent to which an asset is threatened by an event so what actually happens in cyber when you actually when you say cyber risk what actually we mean by that the information systems can be corrupted or compromised it can result in operational safety security failures and there are three fundamental entities in there when you talk about cyber risk the confidentiality integrity and availability that is if my data is stolen or lost or taken by someone without my permission that means i am losing the confidentiality if my data going from point a to point b or residing in a computer can be altered the integrity is lost and if the data is not made available to me at the precise time when i want it then the issue of availability so the ultimately when you do risk analysis we are trying to address the three, three things is the confidentiality affected is the integrity affected is the availability affected just to take a little bit detail here when you talk of a information system technology let us say a payroll a finance payroll the confidentiality is of highest importance the chief executive pay, pay packet is highly important or the legal documents integrity comes next and availability is the last all are important i am not saying availability is not important but in the order of priority but when you go to ship chart uh, or in the ship design office is designing a ship then the engine control system if you are talking about a control system the feedback sensor the data from the feedback sensor availability is of utmost importance the confidentiality comes bit later we are not really worried if the speed pick up signal is known to everyone but it should be available so that the governor can take the correct action so availability is important next comes integrity and confidentiality so when you are doing a risk analysis the order the priority of cia is just reversed it is aic in case of operation systems and cia in case of it systems so one of the important things which people mostly we found in our i will come to the slide make a mistake is applying the same cia order hierarchy when doing operation systems also and finally what is the risk management we are trying to identify what are the risk first of all we identify the systems first of all start some systems 
identify the systems, identify the risk, analyze the risk, and say whether risk is, we can have a risk matrix saying high, low, or medium, and assess them, and then how do we reduce the risk? Some risk, we can accept it. The organization can take a call. Yes, I do accept this risk. Or yes, no, I can't accept. I have to mitigate it. Means I have to reduce the level from maybe level high to low, medium, or medium to low. This is a call which organization takes depending on its capability and capacity to take the risk. When you do a risk assessment, especially from shipyard, shipyard point of view, it has to be done at three different levels. One is the top level. That is risk to the organization itself. What are the organization risk? What are the priorities? What is the budget? So that risk is totally different. And that doing the risk also is important because the top management can get an idea, the importance and the budget it has to cater for to do this kind of work. Then come the middle level risk, where actually your procedures, reviews, second level budget, working budgets are placed. And operation level is actually where the production platform is there, what all the operation controls, what controls are there, and what controls can go wrong if a cyber attack happens. The process of risk assessment is a cyclic, you can say, total feedback system. First of all, we have to establish the context. What is the context? What is my scope? What I am doing? And what are my boundaries? Then identify the risk. This can be from local persons or is by external person. And what are the, then you evaluate the risk. That is, impact the loss of a particular system, how it is going to affect my organization, how it is going to affect my system, my process. Then analyze them. Then it is ideally very correct to prioritize, to mitigate all the risk, but you need to prioritize because everyone's budget is limited and some risks can be absorbed and can be done at later stage. So then you prioritize the risk, monitor and review what you have done, and again, close the loop. If in the process we find a new risk coming up, again, we have to establish and identify the whole loop goes on. One of the earlier speakers has correctly said that some of the instruments what we have are not very prescriptive in their mitigation measures. Saying that you should be good, things should be doing fine. I mean, there are those sentences are good, but unless you have a prescriptive requirements, then it is left to the user to define what is good and implement, which may not be good or may be partially good. So one standard, which is 6244 is the IEC standard, which is basically for cybersecurity with the industrial applications. It talks about levels, security level. Why security level? To give an example, a particular piece, like, let us say in a home, we have a paper, a newspaper, which you keep on t point. Whereas my house papers, house documents, I keep it in locker, maybe in the house, maybe in the bank locker. Both are piece of papers. Why the discrimination? Because the value attached to it and how the risk is happens in case the piece of paper is lost. So depending on the asset value and the capability of the attacker or his intention to come and attack it, the security level can change. Why should you do this? Because then unnecessarily we don't dump all the security controls to a system which really doesn't want it and keep higher level security controls to a system which needs it. So if you look at the attacker capability, his motivation, I can have a capability. Suppose a shop with nothing, who's selling only papers. The motivation of an attacker is very less to rob those uh, old papers. But if he goes, goes to ATM, his motivation is very high. That is the motivation has to be there for the attacker. First, you are able to judge the motivation and the capability, then the security levels will change. Then depending on the security level, we can have zones. We can have a production zone. We can have an administrative zone. 
so that similar security features can be put in all those areas. Then between the zones, when you talk, it should be through a conduit. I will just follow it with a small slide, which makes it more clear. And sir, if you may also conclude it fast, they will do that. Just five minutes. Yeah. Huh. And the requirement. Five minutes are, is a long time. Maybe another huh? one minute or so. Ah, uh, couple of minutes. Huh? Yeah. The, the requirements are there for cyber risk. There are IEC has got requirements to address the cyber risk at every security level. So these are four levels where the level one is casual, more intentional, and sophisticated means and the action resources. This is what we talked about the three zones, production, ship design, and enterprises. You can have a different zones with different security levels. And it defines uh, requirements. It has got a requirement like, and most important thing is align the process, the technology, and the people. Because unless these three things are aligned and people are properly trained, no technology is going to help us. So what all we talked about IAX and IAX also established panel. Mr. Patnagar already briefed the panel what we are representing. And to assist the industry, IRS has got guidelines for uh, implementation for ship and shore establishments. Since we are talking about a lot of control systems, their approval becomes very important. So we have a guidelines for type approval. And the control system software is very important for the whole operation. The guidelines for control system and certification is also important. And our guidelines are based on these standards. 27,443 in NST. And this is common things which are found when we audited many of the land installations, lack of policies, direct communication between business land and operation lands, insufficient or out of date controls, missing patches. There's patch management is very poor. Risk analysis does not consider OT systems and low network segregation between both. So we offer the following services like cyber safety compliance certificate for land. And of course, for ships, we have additional notations. We do carry out gap analysis to know where you are at present when you want to implement something. It's very important to know where we are at present. Control system component certification, hardware certification, verify the implementation after a yard or ship implements it. And of course, the training is very important as we talked, unless the people are trained, are aware and know the process, no amount of technology is going to really help us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sri uh, Srinivas. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, over to you, um, uh, Mr. Bhatnagar. Mr. Bhatnagar, he has to mute it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Um, all the speakers actually, th this was a session where you know, and um, we were all elated that uh, the speakers wanted to give much more. Uh, however, we, we were constrained with the timings. So, the, you know, and now I leave the floor open uh, to actually uh, start with the question answer session. Uh, Anukul. Uh, uh, are you uh, there? If you can take up the questions and put it across to the speakers. All right. Very good afternoon. Good morning to you, the esteemed guests. Uh, there's a question which has been posted uh, to Mr. Srinivas. Uh, Mr. Srinivas, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. All right. Uh, uh, there's a question regarding, can you briefly tell us about artificial intelligence? Okay. I mean, that is a subject by itself, but to put it very briefly, Artificial intelligence starts where it is again a, based on software, but the software has got the ability to learn by itself. That is, uh, normal software, what happens, you program it, it behaves in a fixed way. You give an input, it takes an output, gives an output based on the logic. But in artificial intelligence, it starts learning by its process and keeps on changing its algorithms. So it becomes starts thinking more like a humans and more to a, and there are different levels when we call machine learning, AI, the two or three different levels are there. But that they put it in very short in this short question, that's how the artificial intelligence it starts thinking. So without much of human intervention, it can start, it can let us say playing a chess is one of the AIs where it can play a chess with the computer. Mm. Uh, 
any other further questions which anybody has uh please either uh, put in the chat box or uh, anybody want to ask and raise a hand so that we can unmute you and you can ask it directly to the speakers uh i think sir amit sir there is none uh, so i think we can go ahead okay so uh, i i leave it to the uh, session chair uh, to give his concluding remarks so that we can close the session after that Uh, okay. quick, uh, closing remarks, sir. Yeah, sure, sure. I know <laughs> that's the lunch time. Uh, actually, these subjects are so interesting, you know, and uh, each of these uh, title well explained. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Captain Vidyut Banarji, Sir Pralay Bhattacharya, and also Sri Srinivas. Coming back to uh, fast speakers, uh, my concluding uh, remarks are. Uh, the advantage of uh, safety what uh, captain vidyut banerjee has spoken is main uh, main goal is to return on investment and uh, he has correctly identified 48 chief accidents and uh, even though there is uh, sms uh, available existing sms available accidents uh, he concluded that the accidents uh, they are made to happen they don't happen themselves and a few factors the, which have uh, Had developed in the recent past at the stress level, difference between promise and practice, and the uh, certified companies are becoming <laughs> bankrupt. <laughs> That's the worst thing can happen. And the cunnings are winning. The uh, cunnings are winning, and the winners uh, they are taking all these off. Some management problems are there with respect to uh, garbage landing, narcotics landing. Uh, and uh, these are not well explained uh, uh, by imo also just uh, it appears that this regulations are just written and thrown to the ship owners and uh, how to do it they have not given any process and uh, finally he what he said that 20% actually of the of the causes are causing actually the 80% headaches of the accidents now coming to pralay bhattacharya a security problem causing a loss of a huge amount of money actually and in a business like this causing this much of money i wonder if the same amount of money monetary loss is caused to ivm or microsoft or even to apple whether they would be able to sustain the it technologies would be able to sustain over the years and shipping has been there for almost 5000 years and it's constantly bombarded with all these uh, monetary losses the two hours have become the they have uh, become the guest of the ships of the ship owners and thus the countries uh, israel countries are not not taking any action and blaming the ships for it uh, smuggling is also another important factor arms smuggling also another important factor tin what uh, mr polay bhatjaji correctly identified that 10% of rerouting of the ships causing 2.34 billion dollar I mean, I wonder uh, that how the shipping has been sustaining for such long time. And uh, I, uh, the one thing I wanted to uh, add to this is the same amount of money is invested in those piracy-prone areas, countries, and then these countries would develop, and the piracy would stop. And say not even the same, but say fifty percent of this that would solve the problem. Now coming to see Srinivas uh, talks of. Uh, identifying external and internal risks very well explained and i was listening it very carefully unfortunately we didn't have that much of time and i was wondering if uh, uh, part of this uh, presentation if uh, uh, mr sinivas can share with us we will really appreciate i will uh, sir yeah it's it's a very interesting subject in today's world uh, stealing intellectual data sensitive data uh, and <laughs> he has Uh, uh, very correctly identified the different zones and the motives, how they are related to each other in protecting the the values of the assets that need to be taken care of. So that uh, what he said, the normal paper we keep it on the table, but a paper that is has some kind of uh, huge monetary value, we'll always keep it inside the safety lock lockers. Thank you once again to Captain Vidyut Banerjee, Mr. Pralay Bhattacharya, and also Mr. Sinivas. Over to you, uh, Mr. Bhatnagar. thank you thank you sir for the uh, am, am i visible yeah, yeah. Uh, thank, thank you sir for the closing comments and uh, we had uh, an excellent session today uh, 
and uh, since there is hardly any time for the next session left uh, we would uh, close for this session and uh, we will come back at 11:30 ist dot it's 7 minutes from now uh, meanwhile uh, anukul can run some uh, videos as convenient uh, thank you uh, yes sir the students uh, will they be presenting anything should i give them yeah yeah they permission? they all will be presenting uh, there so uh, let them send you uh, a message if students they have already logged in then probably they can uh, send a personal message to uh in the chat box shipping uh, id or, or the direct chat, chat box uh, where uh, captain kostab zatta uh, being the host will allow you to have access to uh, the system to make your presentations there thank you and we will meet up shortly indian maritime industry is built on a robust foundation <coughs> and its glorious legacy is carried forward in today's digital age indian register of shipping ir class draws its strength from this rich legacy and stands tall as a leading international classification society and is your partner in maritime risk management <laughs> thank you sir
क्या यही प्यार है हाँ यही प्यार है दिल तेरे बिन कहीं लगता नहीं वक्त गुजरता नहीं क्या यही कुछ और वजह इन बातों की लेकिन अब जाना कहा नींद गई मेरी रातों की चार तरता हूँ मैं भी चांद निकलता नहीं दिल तेरे दिन कहीं लगता नहीं गुजरता नहीं साहब अनम्यूट प्लीज अनम्यूट इलेवन थर्टी अभी तो बहन जी सर कह रहे जोर तो चलता नहीं The Institute of Marine Engineers India so called as initially IMEI existed in India as a division of the Institute of Marine Engineers London The institute came into existence in 1977 and in the year 1982 the institute was registered as a charitable organization The IMEI is constituted with the sole purpose of providing facilities and services to enhance and upgrade the knowledge of its members in order to meet the challenges of the profession the institute has a structured governing council to help its functioning the first governing council was formed in the year 1980 the university allows the members to enlist imei also allows marine engineers based overseas to join the institute offers large range of services to its members The present membership is over 18,000 and spread globally. The members are the top decision makers in the maritime and associated industries. The institute, through its membership and its office bearers, is playing an active role in the various maritime activities around the world. IMEI has taken several initiatives to provide high-quality seafarers to the industry. The institute has teamed up with the Directorate General of Shipping. to implement ambitious staff based exams for the seafarers which has been a grand success i am ei is partner to the institute of marine engineers science and technology london also known as imrest the imrest provides i am ei student members with full membership benefits of having access to the imrest library 
The Institute has also constructed an air condition guest house for the members from the new goal. The Institute has also established itself as one of the pioneer training institutions for deeply shipping approved training courses for seafarers for both preparatory and management level. IMDI Navi Mumbai is one of the very few training institutions which imparts simulator-based training. The Institute has signed an MOU with Andhra University Vishakapatnam for development of a state-of-the-art center of excellence, which shall have modern facilities to impart highest quality of training to marine engineers. The Institute is actively contributing to the cause of promoting the seafarers from India. Certificate of Proficiency for Able Seafarer Engine. The Institute has its registered office in Mumbai and branches at Chennai, Delhi, Goa, Kochi, Kolkata, with a chapter at Patna, Mumbai, with a chapter at Navi Mumbai and Gujarat, Pune, and Vishakhapatnam, with a chapter at Hyderabad. IMEI is an active member of the prestigious World Maritime Technology Congress, which is an international body of 26 professional associations from global maritime industry. The Institute organizes four yearly events, such as International Maritime Conference and Exhibition in Marco at Mumbai, Marine Symposium at Chennai, and Global Maritime Seminar, Lomars at Vishakhapatnam. IMEI's monthly journal, Marine Engineers Review, published since 1982, the members receive it free of cost. The Institute publishes books related to the maritime field, which are available at discounted price to the members. The Institute is an excellent forum for the marine engineers who deliberate various technical issues related to maritime field. The Institute has been actively participating at the forums within the country and outside for development of marine engineering. The Institute has been instrumental in providing world-class training to the seafarers, thus enabling them to meet the international challenges. IMEI aspires to produce seafarers who are enthusiastic, skilled, and technically abreast to accept and meet the life challenges with the best of potential. Okay, sir, I think. Yes, sir, please go ahead, Gautam Sen, sir. Okay, sir. I'll start now. Okay. Actually, this is the student session. I mean, there are six young married engineers who will be speaking on this. Out of them, two are from Bangladesh. That's the, the, I mean, that makes the whole conference really international. Now, the chairman of this session, Mr. K. Mohan Rao, the principal officer of MMD Calcutta. I have the honor of introducing him, though he doesn't require any introduction. But, I mean, as a matter of protocol, I'll give his introduction, please. Obtained B.Tech Mechanical Engineering from Nagarjuna University, Andhra Pradesh, 1989 to 93 batch. Joined as junior engineer in prestigious Indian public sector shipping company, the Shipping Corporation of India in 1994 and served for three years. Sailed as second engineer and chief engineer with Tolani Shipping Company Limited and Acer Shipping Company Limited Mumbai for five years. Then worked as engineer surveyor and senior surveyor with Indian Register of Shipping and American Bureau of Shipping for four years. Start, started career with Indian Maritime Administration as engineer and ship surveyor in the year 2005, <coughs> holding an extra first class certificate of com competency from India Maritime Administration, Indian Maritime Administration. Represented Indian Maritime Administration in MEPC 72 and MEPC 73 in the years 2011 and 2012 for 
dealing with greenhouse gas gas emission and developing guidelines for ship recycling presently working as principal officer mercantile marine department mr game rao please and you are requested to tell a few words to all of us thank you over thank to you me. sir uh, thank you sir thanks for your kind words uh, good morning uh, namaskar uh, to all respected members of the institute of marine engineers india kolkata branch company of master mariners of india kolkata chapter my dear colleagues friends fellow students ladies and gentlemen i thank you for giving an opportunity to chair this student session of the international shipping conference 2020 along with my senior colleagues mr arvind choudhury engineer ship surveyor captain nirmal mandal nautical surveyor and mr nishant baskaran ship surveyor i congratulate and appreciate the committee members of the international shipping conference for taking the lead and organizing this international event at this ancient maritime hub for shipping and maritime training also the committee had a vision and given an opportunity to a maritime students to share their innovative thoughts ideas and their vision to an international conference as we all know today's work today meant maritime students are tomorrow the future of the shipping industry and future of this prospect to maritime nation i hope all the participant will enjoy this young prospective student session and i will and i welcome all the participants and the speakers in this session thanks for sparing the time for this valuable session thank you thank you very much now the first speaker of the day is cadet wagmare and his topic is something uh, i mean the is very catchy what in water w a w t what in water energy from the ocean to propel ships one thing i'd like to remind the cadets that this is, your time is limited to 10 to 12 minutes please huh? so please try to stick to that time so now sri wagmare to speak yes, so so may i get the whole sides yeah just a minute Okay, I made you the co-host. Uh, you can go ahead. Thank you, sir. So, should I begin, sir? Sure. Go ahead, please. So is the screen visible? Is the screen sharing visible? Yes, yes. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank the International Shipping Conference to present me with this opportunity for presenting this paper on such a wonderful and huge platform. Thank you. Now, without any further ado, I would begin my presentation. Introduction: What in water? Energy from the ocean to propel the ships, as the title suggests. This paper is about harnessing the energy from the ocean, converting it into a usable form, and with that energy, you how to propel the ships. Now, alternative to a current fuel and energy source, the question is: Is this really needed? The answer to this question lies in the IMO 2020 sulfur cap, which restricts the sulfur emissions to 0.5 percent outside the sulfur emission control areas and 0.1 percent inside the sulfur emission control areas. Now, one might ask, why not change to low sulfur fuel or ultra low, low sulfur fuel or any carbon-based fuel for that matter? The answer lies in IMO's vision for 2050 uh, regarding the reduction uh, of emission of greenhouse gases. The first point is the IMO plans to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions compared to the year 2008 by 40% till the year 2030 and by 70% CO2 reductions by 2050. Also, it has a vision to reduce the total greenhouse gases compared to the year 2008 50% by the year 2050. 
Now, instead of changing the fuel every decade and retrofitting new and new equipments like scrubber towers on the ships, is it not better to change once and for all into a fuel that will give zero emissions? And what better is a fuel that gives zero emission other than uh, electricity? Now, water is a powerhouse of energy. Allow me to explain why. First, the abundance of water in the earth. Almost 70% of the earth's surface is covered with water. Number two, the density of this water is 1000 times when compared to air. So for the same flow rate, the water turbine will generate more power than compared to the air turbine having when the mass flow rates of water and air is same. Another example is for the same power to generate, water has to move at only 12 miles per hour, while the air we need a wind speed of 110 miles per hour to obtain the same amount of power from the turbines. So due to this physical property of water, the ocean currents and the tides contain an enormous amount of energy that can be captured, converted to a usable form. Now, let's see the first ways of harnessing energy from the oceans. The first way was the tidal energy, uh, the tidal energy. and we used to uh, install the tidal barges and the, or the seabed installed turbines. I won't dwell deep into this topic, but I'll tell you the disadvantages. Number one is the installation of this turbine was difficult. Number two, the maintenance of this turbine was a nightmare. And number three, oh, the velocity of the water, as we know, is the, at its minimum in the near the seabed and maximum near the water level, near the surface of the water. So hence, this turbine couldn't observe the optimum of the water velocity, and hence, it's, uh, it, has, it gave a low power output. Now, there was a company called Blue Tech, which advanced, uh, which recognizes uh, uh, this disadvantage and uh, makes a new uh, uh, power harnessing equipment. It is also known as the Blue Tech Floating Tidal Power Plant. Now, this power plant is a floating platform which is removed from all its four sides and anchored to the seabed. Moreover, the advantages of this power, pl uh, power plant is it contains the turbine which is attached near the water level. Thus, we can obtain and harness the energy from the ocean, from the tides at its highest points. And the second, as you can see in the diagram, the ease of shipping and logistics, this power plant can be assembled by using only four shipping containers. Hence, this advantages. Now, why energy from the ocean currents? How is it better from that of the tides? Number one, the tide is a bidirectional flow and the flow is not almost constant. Hence, the power output keep, may keep on varying. However, the ocean currents is a reliable flow of energy, uh, is a reliable flow. It is constant and it is unidirectional in nature. And number two, it's a large source of energy. According to a source, an estimate of the oh, kinetic energy contained in the world's ocean current is about 200 trillion watt hours of energy. Even if we could harness about one or two percent of this, it would be a game changer for everyone. Now, there's a, oh, what is this ocean-based project? Ocean based project, ocean based is a uh, startup which, in collaboration with the Florida Atlantic University, has installed a set of ocean current, uh, ocean energy converter that is the ocean turbines 25 meters deep into the sea and 30 kilometers off the coast of Florida, Palm Beach. It, uh, each turbine is capable of generating around 1 to 1.5 megawatt per hour, um, and uh, uh, with a, uh, a set of these turbines will give you 2 to 3 megawatt hours of electricity. This, uh, the ocean base has a further plan of expanding the, uh, and creating a grid of 5 gigawatt hour um, of uh, these turbines within 8 to 10 years of its installment and with the estimated cost of 16 billion US dollars. Also, it has an ambi ambitious plan of installing a grid of 60 gigawatt uh, in the ocean conveyor's belt of the Gulf Stream, although no commitments have been made to this plan. Are the limitations of the ocean current uh, technology. Now, the initial cost of the floating power plant is very high, as you could see a simple set of two turbines uh, come uh, and uh, create an entire grid of that just to generate 5 gigawatt of power. The cost is $16 million. Number two, tremendous scope to destroy the marine ecosystem. So as is, uh, many of you might be aware that the marine species use this ocean currents to navigate themselves to find their food. Hence, the installation of these turbines might disrupt that ecosystem and it might hamper and cause a negative effect on marine life. Uh, marine life. Number three, 
the the harsh marine environment which can be neglected in the tidal plants near the coast can not be neglected in the right in the middle of the ocean and now the last point is even to, uh, the tidal energy is a recent uh, development uh, the technological advancement is not so much in this uh, field however when you compare to that of the ocean uh, current technology it is years ahead or not maybe decade uh, decades ahead so uh, in technology wise the ocean current technology is lagging behind now we are considering about electric propulsion but uh, i have a question do these ships really exist all electric ships do they really exist the answer of this is yes in china there is a 2000 dead weight tonnage fully battery powered all electric coal carrier which runs along the pearl river it is driven by a 2400 kilowatt hour battery system with a maximum speed of 7 knot it is a zero emission battery uh, zero emission technology ship and most people consider this as an irony since it's a coal carrier it is if you are redu reducing the ship's emission you just uh, contributing as the coal is burning in a power plant and raising the emissions over there here yeah, this is a ship now yara bokilat no way said that i won't be behind the the electric propulsion now it has installed it is making its own ship called yara bokilat uh, it uses a battery power of 9 megawatt hour and it can be charged by its norwegian shore power it is not only a zero emission ship or but it can be also considered as negative emission vehicle because it is planned to estimate around 40000 tra uh, truck journeys every year efficiently making it a negative uh, emission vehicle now the solution for long voyage electric propulsion the present technology limits the electric propulsion to only and only inland navigation and defers it from being used to long voyages the invention of a floating platform for power generation from ocean currents has paved a way for long voyages using electric propulsion with the use of that invention the generation of electricity isn't just focused on the shore base or land base or coastal hydroelectric power tidal plants but it is possible now to generate electricity right in the middle of the ocean a feat which was considered impossible before if the floating pla platforms were to be placed on a large scale based on a large grid to harness the ocean current uh, energy on the roots of the major currents and instead of the tidal power plants which were restricted to the coast it was made for we could harness an unimaginable amount of energy rather than now the second uh, solution is rather than sending this energy to the shore via the cables why don't we collect this energy and make the grid or the sub grid an independent and intersection intersection with the shipping routes thus even though electric propulsion uh, won't take a far, uh, won't take a ship far enough we can increase the total distance of these um, of the ship by the introduction of this plant well uh, uh, just before the journey the battery is exhausted the um, these plants can replenish the battery system of the ship uh, thus long voyages can be achieved now the now the conclusion for this is till now we have limited our search to only and only 30% of the earth's surface that is the land and not seven and the not and we have neglected the remaining 70% but we need to find an alternative no, uh, while expanding um, our hindsight there is as i said before there is almost 200 trillion watt hours of energy in the form of kinetic energy only and only in the ocean currents if we can harness about one if we can harness about 1 to 2 percent of this energy it would be a game changer and the entire need of the maritime industry could be sustained uh, to conclude that even though this technology is in its initial stages and is limited the initial cost might be high but if the mark, uh, but if there is a market for such technology such installation there would be a surge in the technological advancement and a drastic reduction in the cost uh, while someone rightly said for fuel producers to scale up production a market needs to exist but a market will not appear before the fuel is available and with that i conclude thank you jain okay thank you now i think i request the second speaker mr arms bhatnagar who is a student of tulani maritime institute fourth year the previous mr uh, 
Wagmare was also from Tulane Institute and fourth year cadet. So Mr. Arnold Bhatnagar's topic is future of ship shipping and underwater research, hybrid underwater vehicles. That is, this is his topic. Mr. Arnold Bhatnagar, please. Good morning, sir. Uh, may I please have the host rights? Uh, yes, I have made you the co-host. Thank you, sir. So is the PPT visible? Ah uh, yes, uh, visible. You can go ahead. Right, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the need for underwater exploration now is more than ever. Humans have explored more of the surface of the moon than our own ocean bottom which in itself proves how challenging and equally rewarding this final frontier is. And like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle once said, like many other great things, the time for this too is now. A very good morning to the August gathering. I am Cadet Ansh Patnagar, pursuing my engineering at the Tulani Maritime Institute, here to present my study on future of shipping and underwater research, hybrid underwater vehicle. The study looks at different products that are used in industry and amalgamates them into a hybrid underwater vehicle of my own. Underwater research is breaking down barriers in multiple fields. It has enabled biologists to redefine their definition of life and also provides clues in finding extraterrestrial life. While the most important reason to explore the seafloor is to locate economically viable oil wells. Oil wells are usually found between 4,000 and 6,000 meters below sea level. However, with current trends in consumption, it has become essential to locate new oil fields. Research indicates that more oil and gas fields can be found at greater depths. Hence, multiple pioneers over the last 60 years have decided to explore the marine trenches or the Hadal zones which extend down to 11,000 meters below the surface of the sea. The tools that they use for subsea exploration are underwater vehicles. Underwater vehicles are widely used in research and defense applications as subsea crafts. Underwater research vehicles are subclassified into three types based on operational control. Autonomous underwater vehicles, which are run by an artificial intelligence for a pre-programmed mission, which is usually data collection. Remotely operated vehicles that are remote controlled by humans for the deploying mothership for missions that require a very minute maneuvering of the vehicle and hybrid underwater vehicles. A vehicle that can be made both an AUV and an ROV at sea itself to suit the requirements of the mission. Our study describes a hybrid vehicle. For any new development, more than half the issues are solved at the design phase. The design required minimal weight of the craft while providing adequate strength and minimal generation of noise that would result in power losses. After a lot of research, the solution was to create a torpedo type design for the general body, which allowed lighter materials to be used in the construction of the chassis. The material that need to be used for the construction of the chassis need to withstand high pressure for long durations constantly and also had to deal with the harsh environments of the ocean floor. As a result, great fire titanium was selected as a material of choice for the construction of the chassis. For the casings and buoyancy spears, alumina ceramic was used to the same effect. Buoyancy is an integral part of the construction and hence a twin flooded hull is used with 99% ceramic flotation spheres. As you can see, these are individually stuck with PVC boots to the vehicle. The conclusion of the mathematics involved is shown whereby these provide additional buoyancy to an already buoyant neutral craft as seen for the AUV and the ROV. Another important requirement for the functioning of the equipment is the ambient pressure. Since most equipment and circuitry is designed for one ATM pressure, thus pressure holdings made of 96% aluminum ceramic are used. In order to maintain a high bandwidth connection between the surface and ocean flow, optical fiber cables are used as data tethers. These allow for fast maneuverability of the HUV 
as well as maintain a high resolution real time feed optical fiber as you can see is lowered with the rov via a depressor to the required depth wherein the vehicle detaches from the depressor with the connected fiber and proceeds to its mission the artificial intelligence serves as the primary controller during an autonomous mission and works as an intelligent support during the human controlled missions where it can give recommendations based on its own experience the ai used in mission control allows for safe patrolling and crunching of data as per the requirement it also directs the craft to the mothership during the resurfacing of either auv or rov mission the ai is given the ability to make its own decisions and gain experience through neural networks the convolution neural network allows for the ai to learn new things with minimal memory usage it uses the principle of breaking down lots of data primarily images into minuscules and then reconstructing them through predetermined weights this allows for quick learning and easy adaptability of the ai which is better able to estimate variables with time it is supported by the deep belief network which in a nutshell is multiple hidden layers capable of pre-training the ai by making simulations of everything that is learned leading it to better a lot parameters and judging situations the ai also uses projection mapping which uses 2d input from visual cues and sonar and converts it into a reliable 3d structure that accounts for spatial dimensioning this helps in finding the safest and fastest routes for traversing to keep data safe from losses through attenuation and secure from unauthorized block unauthorized information sources blockchain technology is used acoustic telemetry is used to send feedback of the vehicle position and health to the mothership every 30 to 45 seconds during an unmanned mission in order to account for noise and attenuation the signal is repeated by multiple modems additional features the vehicle has a navigation seat to aid in navigation these are the products assorted for the navigation each of which is extremely accurate for its specific task excuse me the complete navigation seat accounts for variation in temperature pressure and density and is accurate with 0.01% of error it converts the feedback into data packets for the mothership electrical propulsion is used with a 16 kilowatt hour battery system connected to a 50 volt bus the propulsion load is the maximum and thus decides the duration of the mission in order to extend the mission duration the propeller design is optimized rudimentary mathematical conclusions from the study of hybrid vehicle nereus were used for this recommendation and are shown here lighting lighting is done by light emitting diode arrays 16 such arrays together form a puck which is physically connected to the hull with three additional pucks that serve as backup here is a live example of a lighting system on the underwater vehicle on nereus cameras that are the cameras used need to have a high resolution images the product recommendation are given in this slide and these are commonly used cameras for multiple underwater research vehicles so this is the industry standard that uh, has been used in this recommendation a manipulator and sampling system is provided this is essentially a robotic arm with 6 degrees of freedom to collect samples from the ocean floor and bring it back to the surface for extended research now on to the operation of this craft a vehicle is put into auv mode assuming today i would like to uh, survey a 50 meter radius at 3000 meters depth from my current mothership location for potential hotspots i can program the ai to do so when the ai would find something tangible it would alert the mothership collect some preliminary data for the rov mission after which it would come back the mothership would move closer to the hotspot while the research vehicle is changed to rov mode in the rov mode the the vessel is tethered and lowered with a depressor towards the hotspot where it it leaves the depressor and then it is controlled by the crew all sampling observations and recordings are done in real time in conclusion underwater research is the key to our future an hrv brings together multiple disciplines of science and technology into a harmonious fusion as technology advances there is a greater scope 
of reinventing, perhaps even shipping by using applications from subsea craft technology. At some point in the future, however, so these are all bit small steps taken towards such a future. I would like to mention that my study is limited to amalgamating different technologies that are used in industry into one product. And this study also does not venture into the economics of its recommendations. Further developments can occur in the study with breakthroughs in the fields of material science to find materials capable of doing multiple dives at longer durations for shorter relaxation intervals in the field of design where more energy efficient designs can be created in the field of internet of things, which may allow us to remotely control such vehicles from thousands of kilometers away in our own homes, using our own smartphones and laptops. And most of all, working towards universal human occupied vessels that can allow for prolonged stays at the ocean floor for research or other activities. I would like to thank everyone for their patient listening and would be willing to address all of your queries in the question answer session. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, third speaker is Mr. Sovik Datta. He is fourth year student of Department of ne uh, Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering of Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Mr. Somik Datta, he is fourth year and now his subject is study of hydrodynamic coefficient and motion motion nature due to the shape change of floating objects. I'll read it out again. Study of hydrodynamic coefficient and motion nature due to the shape change of floating objects. Mr. Shomik Datta, please. Yeah. Shomik, I may do the co-host for sharing. Okay, sir. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm sharing the slide. Uh, will you see uh, CD? Is the slide is uh, showing in everyone? By yes, everyone? yes, it is coming. It is coming fine. You can go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, good. Namaskar, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the authority of ICO uh, for giving me an opportunity uh, to show our task in this uh, huge platform. I am Shomik Dutta and my uh, partners are Tanzima Hassan and Rakibullah Hassan uh, Likhon. And we are doing this uh, job under the supervision of Professor Dr. Uh, Muhammad Rafiqul Islam, sir. Um, the previous uh, title of our um, paper was the study of uh, hydrodynamic coefficient and motion nature due to the shape change of a floating object, which is uh, modified uh, slightly uh, in the fi uh, final submission. And the updated title is uh, hydrodynamic coefficients and motion uh, for different uh, shapes of floating bodies. And now it is the motivation of our uh, doing this type of uh, subjects. Uh, in our course, we are using different types of uh, supporting structures uh, for uh, semi-submersible floating co supporting columns, electrical, floating electrical supports uh, in for indication by and various types of uh, objects. Uh, for fulfill this uh, ne uh, necessity of different shapes of supporting structures, uh, we have used uh, multi-dimensional uh, uh, objects and in this paper, their hydrodynamic uh, characteristics has been analyzed. Now our objective, uh, computing the hydrodynamic coefficients for four uh, commonly known shapes, uh, which are used as a column in semi-submersible structure, analyzing six degrees of uh, motion for two different uh, wave heading angles, comparing these results uh, between these objects. Now we have considered some assumptions, that is, uh, the fluid is assumed to be incompressible, irrotational, in viscous, and homogeneous. The fluid motion is considered harmonic. The wave velocity and the amplitude are considered as small. The water depth is considered constant. And the structure of the body is simply uh, completely rigid. And all the motions uh, will be oscillating in sinusoidal. The regular condition is regular. Uh, here comes our methodology. Uh, we have used uh, three dimensional radiation potential th uh, theory uh, for analyzing the for analyzing uh, the floating st uh, structure motions. And in this theory is also known as panel method. Uh, here equation one is uh, uh, showing the velocity potential equation uh, with respect to flow direction. And equation two is showing that with respect to time. Uh, here comes the velocity potential uh, boundary conditions for velocity potential equation. Uh, equation three is showing the 
Laplace equations, equation 4 for free surface uh, boundary condition, equation 5 for bottom uh, boundary condition, equation 6 for body boundary condition, and equation 7 for radiation condition. Uh, by equation 8, we are uh, showing the 3D source distribution techniques uh, in the velocity potential in some point, and equation 9, the normal derivative of green functions. Using this, considering this uh, boundary conditions and the 8 and 9 equations, uh, we have got the final velocity potential of our uh, potential equation, which is denoted by equation 10. And from this velocity potential equation, we have got the added mass coefficient expression, which is denoted by equation 11, and the value of uh, and the equation of damping coefficient, which is denoted by equation 12. Uh, from equation 13, we have expressed the wave excitation force expressions, and by equation 14, the motion equation is expressed. Now, our considering parameters, we have taken a wave frequency of between 0.1 radian per second to 2.9 radian per second, wave height of 1.15 meter, and wave heading angle, quartering, and both C conditions, that is wave heading angle 45 degree and 150 degree, water depth of 15.5 meter, and the draft of FD structure is 2 meter, and the displacement is 1,025 tons. Uh, here is the some model specifications. First, we have taken uh, a circular uh, uh, cylinder which has a radius of 12.616 meter and the uh, depth is uh, 4 meter. Uh, second one is the elliptical shape cylinder uh, which, which major axis is 17.684 meter, uh, minor axis is 9 meter and depth of 4 meter. Third one is, is a square shape box uh, of length and breadth of 22.361 meter and depth of 4 meter. And the last one is a rectangular shape box of length 33.334 meter. Uh, breadth of 15 meter and depth of 4 meter. Now here comes our analyzing result. Um, as uh, the structure of our stationary and for the value of added mass and the web damping will be same for the both uh, headache condition. So we are uh, showing only one graphs. Uh, in figure 5, uh, the value of added mass uh, with the encountering frequency for search motion the added mass is plotted in y direction and the encountering frequency is plot with in the x direction. Uh, from figure five, we can show that the value of added mass is maximum for the square box. And figure six is showing the value of added mass with encountering frequency for sway motion. And here, the value is maximum for the rectangular box. Uh, now in figure seven, uh, it is for uh, added mass with encountering frequency for hip motion. And here, the uh, Curves are almost close to each other and not much variations. And figure eight is showing the value of added mass with encountering frequency for roll motions. Uh, now figure nine, uh, it is for uh, the value of uh, encountering added mass for in with encountering frequency for pitch motions. And equation 10 is, uh, figure 10 is for the added mass with encountering frequency for your motions. Uh, in these graphs, we are seeing that the maximum value is come from, came from the elliptical shape cylinder. Uh, now, wave damping coefficients uh, with encountering frequency. Uh, figure 11 is for uh, the wave damping uh, with encountering frequency for surge motion. Figure 12 is for the wave damping, damping frequency for uh, sway motion. Uh, here we have plot uh, the wave damping coefficients uh, in the y direction and the encountering frequency in the x directions. Uh, figure 13 uh, for the wave damping with encountering frequency for heap motions. And figure 14 is for the wave damping for encountering frequency with encounter frequency for the roll motions. Uh, in figure 14, we are seeing that uh, the values are almost uh, close as we seen in the added mass graph for the hip motion. And in figure 14, the wave damping value is maximum for the square shape objects. And here is uh, in figure for the wave damping with encounter frequency for pitch motions. And uh, in figure 16, wave damping with encounter frequency for the sway uh, for the EO motion. Uh, in these uh, graphs, it is also as the um, graph of uh, added mass graph, that is the maximum value is come from the elliptical shape cylinder. Now, the row mo motion with uh, motion amplitude operator graph for with uh, encountering frequency. Uh, figure uh, 17 is for the row encountering frequency with search motion and figure 18 uh, for the uh, row with encountering frequency for the sway motion. Uh, here we have plot the uh, row uh, the in y-axis and encountering frequency in the x-axis. 
uh, figure 19, that is a uh, route with encountering frequency heat motion. Uh, and we have seen that uh, the maximum value is for the cylindrical shape and the elliptical shape. And near uh, encountering frequency 0.8, the encountering frequency is matched with the natural frequency of this uh, structure. And it is causing a resonance effect near the uh, 0.8 radian frequency, uh, 8 radian per second. And figure 20 is uh, for the uh, Rao with encountering frequency for row motion. And here is also we are seeing the resonance effect and it is near the 1.3 encountering frequency 1.3 radian per second. Now you go, uh, figure 21 is Rao with encountering frequency for pitch motions and figure 22 is Rao with encountering frequency for your motion. Uh, now for uh, these graphs are for the bow uh, heading condition that is for heading angle 150 degree. Uh, these uh, ca graphs characteristics are almost uh, similar to the quartering condition we have seen before. Uh, here we have uh, plot uh, the Rao value in the x axis, uh, sorry, y axis, and the encountering frequency values in the x axis. So figure 23 is for the Rao with encountering frequency for surge motion. And figure 24 is Rao with the encounter frequency for the sway motions. Uh, figure uh, 25 has come for the similarly for the heap motions, and figure 26 is for the roll motion. And the last two graphs uh, that is figure 27, which is uh, for the uh, pitch motions, and figure 28, uh, Rao with encounter frequency for the yo motions. Now come to our, the last thing that is discussion and conclusions. As from the graphical presentation, we have seen that our heap, roll, and pitch motions are small for the rectangular and square shape object, whereas it is uh, quite larger for the circular and elliptical shape cylinders. So uh, we can say that, as we know, the stability of a structure is depends on the roll and the pitch motions, and the structural bottom can be damaged uh, from a large amount of uh, heap and pitching motions. So if we use uh, rectangular and square shape objects, which will be safer uh, rather than the cylindrical and circular uh, elliptical shapes object as a floating bodies like semi-submersible. Again, uh, from the um, dimensions, we can see that uh, for same displacement, if the length of the uh, body is increasing, the magnitude of these uh, uh, motions are decreasing and the resonance uh, region is also decreasing. So it is. Uh, it will be better for us uh, if we use these uh, types of structures. Uh, besides that, a human will also feel uh, much comfortable in rectangular and square shape uh, structures rather than in cylindrical shapes or structures. Uh, in future, uh, we will try uh, to using the mooring systems and the irregular sea condition. As you all see, uh, we have done it for the, uh, only for regular sea condition and uh, as a free, uh, freely simple uh, floating structure. So we will consider the mooning system and irregular sea condition in future. And that's all from me. Thanks for uh, listening to me with patience. Thank you. If you have any question, you can freely ask me. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Gupta. Now, the fourth speaker of the day is Mr. Jawad Zulkarenin Muhammad. He is again a fourth year uh, student of Department of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Actually, I mean, this is for the viewers. I mean, he had some different name, but in the last minute, he suggested, he suggested some new name. So I am giving you this new name. Okay. This is, the, uh, this is as per his suggestion. This is now the title of his article, Resistance and power prediction of different ship hulls using numerical methods. Again, resistance and power prediction of different ship hulls using numerical methods. Now, Dawa Zulkarendi Muhammad. Thank you, sir, for letting me uh, present under the new title. Uh, can I uh, share the screen now? Uh, yes, I made you the co-host. You can go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, is is it uh, visible, my PowerPoint? Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, greetings, respected panel, others and audience. I hope everyone is in good health. Uh, I would uh, like to thank the Honorable 
hosts and the organizers for letting me present my research work in this esteemed and renowned conference. Uh, the title of my research work is uh, Resistance and Power Prediction of Different Ship Hulls Using Numerical Methods. Uh, uh, I myself am the author, Muhammad Jawad Zulkarnain, along with my uh, mates, uh, Muhammad Abid Mahdi and Shomik Datta, and we are all from the Department of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering, Buet, Bangladesh. Okay, so uh, the motivation behind this is, uh, as we all know, that uh, when we are designing a ship, uh, one of the elemental steps is that we have to uh, properly calculate the resistance that the ship will face during its voyage. So there are a lot of methods available for it. Uh, uh, presently, we use CFD-based methods and numerical methods and also towing tank tests. But numerical methods are very convenient because uh, they can give us a quick estimate of the resistance calculation, which is not always possible using CFD or towing tanks. So the motivation of this research work uh, was we actually tried to uh, do the calculation using different numerical methods and draw a sort of comparison between which method is effective for uh, which sort of vessel. So we took in consideration two numerical methods and also uh, we took three different hulls for which we uh, made the resistance calculations. Okay. So the objectives uh, of this research work was uh, we had to uh, compute the hull resistance of three different hulls uh, uh, using numerical approaches, obviously. And uh, to do that, we had to first calculate the resistance components individually. And then after summing the components, we could find the total resistance for each hull. Uh, after we were done uh, calculating the resistance for each hull using different methods, we uh, tried to make a comparison uh, between the methods that which method provided the more uh, accurate results. And also we could uh, draw a conclusion that for which hull, uh, which method will be more accurate. <clears throat> okay, so our methodology was as follows. We chose three benchmark hulls that are uh, very common research topics in the uh, used commonly for research in this propulsion field. The hulls were commonly known as KCS, JVC and KVLCC2. Uh, KCS stands for Criso Container Ship, JVC stands for Japan Bulk Carrier and KVLCC stands for uh, Korean Very Large Crude Carrier. Okay, so what we did was uh, we gathered the principal particulars and the body plan of the ships and uh, using that, we modeled the hull form of the ships uh, using 3D modeling tool. And the numerical uh, methods we talked about, uh, these two methods were the Wyman method and the very well-known haltrop method. Okay, and to find out the resistance of, that the ship must face, uh, we chose a speed range of zero to 25 knots which is basic operating, uh, operating conditions for most ships. Okay. Uh, so what we did was uh, we, I'm sorry, uh, sorry for the interruption. Okay. So what we did was uh, at different ship speeds, we calculated the resistance. And uh, after we find out the resistance, we can easily find out the uh, power that is required by the ship at that uh, certain speed. Okay, so we also found out the speeds and the power at different speeds. Then we uh, plotted them uh, on graphs to find out uh, which uh, method predicted what kind of value for each hub. Okay. Okay, the theoretical background is, uh, as we all know, that when a ship is advancing through the sea or waterways, there are some forces that act against the ship and try to slow down the ship. This is like uh, friction. Uh, that a solid object would face, but uh, in uh, in a fluid. So bas uh, basically, there are many sorts of ways that a ship could undergo such sort of resistance. Uh, some of them are the viscosity of the fluid. Uh, some of it could be due to the wave making, air, etc. And uh, all of those are components that make up the total resistance of the ship. And the total resistance of the ship can usually be uh, by be given by equation one, which is uh, total resistance equals to uh, frictional resistance plus residual resistance. Okay. And there is an alternate way to express this, which is uh, total resistance is equals to viscous resistance plus wave resistance. And um, basically any method will work. We can actually calculate the total resistance using any of the equations one or two. And also uh, the viscous resistance, it can actually be uh, given or shown as a function of the frictional resistance, what we have to do is uh, we calculate the frictional resistance and then we uh, multiply uh, form factor to it. 
okay so after we are done, uh, done finding out the total resistance the power that is needed by the ship to overcome that resistance at a certain speed can be very easily found uh, the formula is we all know the power is equals to force into velocity so in this case the required force is uh, equal to the resistance and the and if we multiply it to the certain velocity that the ship will be cruising in we can find out the total power <sighs> okay so uh, the holder pendulum method this is actually the most commonly used uh, uh, regression method or numerical method and it has been used since 1978 after uh, mr holthrop and menon proposed it what it does is uh, it actually breaks down the all of the the total resistance into a few components uh, the frictional resistance the appendage resistance the bear hull resistance the wave making resistance etc etc and uh, holthrop menon method uh, it actually gives formulations so that we can calculate the uh, calculate each individual component of resistance and after we are done calculating each individual component when we sum them up we can get the total resistance and the thing about holthrop and menon is that uh, uh, excuse me uh, the uh, for the holthrop and menon the basic input that we need is basically the hydrostatic properties or just the principal particulars of the ship uh, using just those properties we can calculate the resistance of any hull form and uh, wyman method is a newer numerical method uh, it is a bit different from Uh, Holthrop Menon. Uh, what it does is, it directly calculates the power that is required by the ship to cruise at a certain speed. And in doing so, what it does is, it actually uh, considers that there might be some sort of loss between the propeller shaft and the engine, and it accounts for that loss and uh, it uh, gives us the power output or the effective power that we need. And to consider or account for that loss, what we have to do is we have to uh, factor in a uh, Of, uh, an overall efficiency factor uh, that will depend on the operating conditions or the hull form okay and uh, here we have the uh, we have the principal particulars of the hull shapes that we chose uh, you can see it in the figure figure 1 um, okay and i have also included the body plans of each hull this is the body plan of the uh, japan bulk carrier ship this is the body plan of the kcs ship uh, and this is the body plan of the kvl cc2 ship okay so uh, uh we actually use the body plan to uh, we input the body plan into a software called rhinoceros to model the hull form and uh, after modeling the hull form we uh, did our calculations using maxurf and holthrop menon method uh, the resistance uh, we are going to have a look at the resistance coefficients that were calculated using only holthrop menon at first so as you can see uh, these are the resistance coefficients for uh, the jbc these are this is a plot of the resistance coefficients for the kcs and this is a plot of the resistance coefficients uh, for the kvl cc2 uh, when we are using the holthrop menon method uh, the coefficients that we uh, calculate are the wave resistance coefficient the bear hull resistance coefficient the viscous resistance coefficient and the correlation coefficient so so what happens is Uh, we can see that the wave resistance coefficient it actually uh, follows somewhat of a similar pattern for jbc and kcs it uh, it is it increases with speed but for kvl cc2 it shows a different pattern the coefficient initially increases with the speed but uh, after a certain point it starts to decline the correlation coefficient it is constant at all sorts of speeds and another interesting point is the viscous resistance coefficient uh, for all sorts of hulls it is actually characterized by a steep initial decline so it declines at first as the speed increases and uh, after a certain uh, ship speed the decline is more gradual so initially the decline is steep and afterwards it's gradual okay uh, now uh, we have shown the plot of the resist uh, residual resistance coefficient calculated both by holthrop menon and also wyman method uh, and we can see that there is actually a huge variation in the results between holthrop menon and wyman especially for the kcs ship and the jbc ship and uh, in case of the kvl cc2 ship uh, it also shows variation but at a, at one point which is at ship speed uh, 10 knots the two plots actually coincide so we can say that at that sort of speed that the wyman method shows some sort of uh, accuracy okay uh, for frictional resistance it is very plain uh, the uh, the frictional resistance is the same whether you calculate it using holthrop menon or wyman method it's all the same for all the ships at uh, okay 
okay now uh, after we are taking into account all the components we can actually find out the total resistance at the different speeds under the range that we have mentioned our range was 0 to 25 knots and uh, interestingly uh, up to a certain speed uh, which is around 5 knots we can see that the holtrop menon results and the wyman uh, wyman results they are almost similar but for the ships uh, kcs and the ship jbc we can see that uh, after 5 knots the results they start to diverge so as we all know how drop menon is the more accurate uh, and established method so we could say that the wyman method actually starts to fail to predict the resistance accurately after uh, 5 knots but for uh, kvlcc2 hull this range is a bit higher uh, the wyman method can accurately predict the total resistance for up to around 15 knots but after that it also starts to diverge from the uh, hull drop menon results and uh, since the power is actually a function of the ship speed into the uh, resistance the power the graphs for power or the plots for power versus speed they also show exactly the same characteristics <coughs> okay so we can uh, come to our conclusions that what we observed was that the variance pattern for viscous resistance coefficient the bear hull resistance coefficient and the wave resistance coefficients with ship speed it was similar for kcs and jbc the kcs ship and jbc ship they show uh, similar characteristics but the variance of these properties with respect to ship speed it had a different trajectory for kvlcc2 also uh, when we were determining the residuary resistance by both methods there was seen that uh, basically for all the methods we had a huge variation uh, between uh, the wyman method results and the how to pen method results so basically we couldn't actually uh, calculate the residual resistance for uh, any hull very accurately using the wyman method and for kcs and jbc uh, as we just saw the total resistance and power figures that we obtained by wyman they agree with the hull to pen for a for a certain range and usually it's it agrees up to a certain range of like 5 knots or up to 7.5 knots but after that they start to diverge so we can say that for kcs and jbc hulls wyman method is not very effective after uh, a certain low speed but for kvlcc2 hulls uh, that range is higher so uh, the wyman method is actually more effective up to higher speeds okay so from that what we can uh, draw uh, the conclusion that we can draw is that basically the wyman method uh, could not uh, show very accurate results uh, over our specified range which was 0 to 25 knots it failed to show accurate results after 5 to 7.5 knots but for uh, kvlc2 hull wyman method was a bit more effective uh, it was uh, it showed a bit more uh, accurate results up to a higher speed range so the wyman method is actually more suited to the kvlc2 hull than it is uh, suited to the kcs and the jbc hull. uh that's all uh, i thank you all for watching and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here i wish you uh, wish everyone well and thank you goodbye thank you now the penultimate speaker is ayush sharma he is a fourth year student of imu mumbai campus and and his topic is maritime sector a compass to the vision of atmanirbhar bharat mr ayush sharma with the topic maritime sector a compass to the vision of atmanirbhar bharat fourth year student of imu mumbai campus mr ayush sharma Yeah, now you're on. Yes. Ayush, I made you the co-host for screen sharing. Yes,
myself i used to learn both the basic students from indian meta and university of university here my topic is meta compared to the vision of art in the world so we all know in ancient times india was known as the great power due to its participation in the trade and various activities which has spread all over the globe but today my main purpose is to put india in the limelight and gain its title of golden bird again through the vision of atmanirbhar bharat giving a brief introduction about india we all know about the link coast line and the various advantages it has the very long coast line of 1.7 km 12 major pole and 187 minor pole a geographical location with of indian peninsula connecting asia australia various the south east asia and even to the europe it holds a very strategic location as well as a very important one for the trade as well as for the hub of all the shipping going through the sea and when we talk about indian maritime sector you yeah, let me tell you 95 95% of the country's trade is moved by our sea first of all i would like to talk about why we need a topic like this why and why india doesn't need it. a maritime sector so prevalent that india doesn't need doesn't have reached the highest optimum level there are serious challenges faced by indian sector in the maritime sector due to some its reason which we will discuss and even i will try to provide some references and solutions which the government as well as my references which we are thinking of sharing first of all i would want to find and say we that we all taxes levied on the various monetary activities which are burden on the industry trade to indian shipping owners is six times costlier as compared to for that's why we have not seen many shit in indian shipping companies inability to gather foreign investment we have a 100% fpi since 1997 but still we have no such you know a visible investment which can gather our line like in the shipping industry and probably we all know like we are losing our own companies to foreign companies they are cutting their own foreign land so it doesn't have to pay the taxes levied by the government i would like to talk about the various taxation structure that taxation will be the income the personal income tax which we have to levy and the differences which all i have been sharing in this sector the third point excessive nirbhata or foreign transportation rules india has a cabotage rule which protects our domestic coastline trader but recently the government is even thinking about relieving these restrictions and even changing about the rofr right of first refusal what is right of first refusal a domestic ship owner has always the first approach he is asked first whether he wants to uh, trade this uh, transit or then he now king about various these some serious number this chart is taken by the report of dp shipping and it significantly shows that in the past decades there has been a reduce of indian transshipment uh, cargo the trade has not been at optimum level there is a slight increase in dry cargo liners but there has been serious shortages in dry bulk cargo bulk carriers and even oil tankers so let me tell you what are the reasons these reasons we all know and we all will we all know about the shipage the infrastructure and various other things which have led to this shortfall of this trade and deficit in india talking about an economic cycle which is the solution in my perspective first of all we definitely need to reform the taxation structure we need to introduce a simplified tax just like gst we can produce a one nation one tax system and you know promote the investors to come to india and have a simplified way of shipping and trade but still there is a loss of 5% taxation of indian ship owners whether they want to trade with indian goods or if they want to trade any foreign goods so it acts as a serious threat to them still now and i think there is certain changes which are still required 
and these changes to assistance sectors even put a negative signal so a gst is a good option recently done by the government scrapping of unnecessary charges just like i talked about the 5% taxation charge the uh, levied by the government on us and even minimum alternative uh, alternative tax which the indian companies have so these structures can even lead to empowering indian citizens we all understand that indian government is in a dilemma to how to counterbalance the indian domestic the to safeguard the interest of our domestic ship owners as well as to safeguard the foreign investors as well so the policy formation should be a domestic balance between them domestic maritime but the important part of it is the maritime development fund which is a long need for the we all know how costly shipping industry is how high the charges can be. so for any new customer to come up in this sector and start any chain there is a need of huge investment and how we get an investment in banks so there should be a specific provision done by the government and back on low rate that can provide huge huge long term funds and can help the sector grow now talking about the second thing international shipping which we have the appropriate assisting infrastructure for our maritime industry as a survey showed us that transportation 11% as compared to global to transportation in the terms of cost it is a huge difference this is it depending on our foreign cash for our, our foreign cash for transportation we lo- lose a revenue of 200 million dollars every year which is a huge number as well there are certain restrictions by the topographical and vegetation but shallow port they are in india indian side has a few shallow port area which doesn't allow high bulk carrier to go up and we need them port Let me tell you about the biggest average age of Indian ships is over 15 years, as compared to global average of 12 years. Let me put it just by this graph. It significantly shows that our 40% of vessels are above the age of 20, and 12 to 20% of vessels are above from 18, 11 to 20 years. So the phrase of age is just a number doesn't add value to this because we know. that a young ship is always with coming back india indian ports have significantly are in equip in certain ways of handling and terminating capacity sometimes we all know the ship have to wait outside the indian coast line area to have a, uh, to go into them and this significantly affects the timing and the efficiency of the system of the ports as well so i will talk about what are the solutions to this infrastructure problem the government have shown us very good ways and very prominent ideas the saga mala program which is a com- constituent of 577 projects a capital Im- investment of 1.42 trillion these projects are specifically based to enhance the transportation the infrastructure development of ports and the saga mala areas of india green pro project it aims to install eco friendly power system like solar and wind on the port of india national industrial corridor development india has a freight corridor 1540 km with eight joining industrial cities these industrial development corridors will enhance the transshipment infrastructure and joining of the major cities and overall connectivity and recently you must have all heard about the all heard the news about the gujarat maritime cluster at the city gandhinagar it's a good initiative by the government and we can add value to it similar inland waterways and coastal shipping a very old idea but not yet applicably used in our country we haven't been able to exploit this idea india has a inland waterways area of 14500 km let me tell you one thing that if you travel your huge bulk cargo to the the cost is 50 paisa per kilometer whereas as compared to 1 kilometer to 1 rupee per kilometer for road and 1.5 per kilometer for railway so you can see how beneficial economically it can be it holds a market share of 0.6% for 
more inland waterways and 6.4 percent of coastal cities. Let me show you with a graph by country. Over 60 percent of our transportation goes through by road, 32 percent by rail, 1 percent by air, and only 0. 0.6% uh, by Indian water, 6.4% by CCC. So India still has a very huge potential market for this sector, which can lead to a significant advancement of this sector. Comparing with the other countries, Japan, Europe, Brazil, China, and US have already gone ahead with this program. And India is yet to use it properly along with this other beneficiaries. Talking about human resource, Sagamala project has already created 10,000 jobs. But still, the process is slow and it has taken over the process of three years. India has a very low idea of labor resources and how we manage our labor law. So, the idea of this doesn't attract many foreign companies. Our seafarers still prefer sailing abroad. Why is that? We all know that. Of the, of the taxation, of the idea of firing uh, of having a foreign company and various other perspectives related to it. India significantly needs digital development and the advancement in the digitalization sector for the shipping industry. India should provide different attractive incentives to seafarers so that they can join Indian shipping companies and go for this go for the vision of partner network as well. Digitalization is the core of the art. We need to digitalize the sector and advance our IT sector in this sector so that the pen paper work and the old Babu Shahi Raj can be go on out as soon as possible. Talking about the social political aspect which affects our shipping industry, democratic approach. You know, democratic approach may sound very appealing, but it doesn't always provide you with the appropriate time. It's a slow process which needs to keep in mind many stakeholders like economic partners, opposition as well, and even the activists, uh, economic, uh, environmental activists as well. Still, private participation hasn't been to optimum level. There are certain partners in four sectors, but still now we haven't been able to use. Talking about the partnerships, how we can enhance it, there are very significant steps to it. First of all, public-private partnership. Joint venture with the partnership of private sector can help the growth of maritime sector to a huge extent. Partnership of private sector can add value to their optimum speed and their control over it and government incentives to it. There can be performance incentives as a use of leverage to attract private partners. International partners. India certainly has a very good geographical location and a very good geographical partners. In India has very good relations with all this, all of the countries in this continent. But what may I tell you that landlocked countries such as Nepal and Bhutan, who doesn't have access to any sea, can act, can India as an add an advantage to them and provide any service for them? That can also come in mind. Various groups like G7, BRICS, BIMSEC, European Union can help India in exchanging these technologies and present, presenting many new ideas to them. India can go with the option of carbon neutral, which can certainly attract European Union because they have always enhanced and liked that idea under Paris Agreement. India can certainly develop maritime clusters on the eastern and western sides of peninsula, and even government is initiating it as well. The Gujarat, Gujarat sector on the west and Tamil Nadu sector on the east. So, on my conclusion, I would like to say that maritime industry is a major contribution to the national development. And if we really want to make India great, we have to focus on our maritime sector. We have to focus on our major stakeholders, our domestic partners, to enhance our modern sector, to infrastructure, and reform the global scenario of changing our policy to the maritime sector. We have to learn from our past. In this COVID-19, I have realized and I have introspected daily and things which I need to do. Certainly, our country needs to do it as well. And if India wants to become Atman Nirbhar Bharat and if it wants to compete with the global, global leading partners like China and Japan and US in terms of various sectors, India certainly needs to focus on this maritime because that's the key to Atman Nirbhar Bharat. Contributed to significantly in my paper presentation. Did you
leadership in steady iq various new leadership priorities and i am thankful to all of them so in the last i would like to say thank you to all of you for listening to so kindly and any questions from your side are most welcome thank you thank you mr ayush sharma thank you for a very good speech now the last speaker of the day is mohammad abid hadi he is again a fourth year student of bangladesh university of engineering and technology department of naval architecture and marine engineering okay. his topic is a study on motion sickness incidents at several positions of a ship in irregular waves i'll read it out again a study on motion sickness incidents at several positions of a ship in irregular waves mohammad abir mahadi please thank you sir yes i have made you the co-host for screen sharing thank you am i visible sir yes yes thank you very much honorable chairman for giving me the opportunity to present our paper distinguished participants good afternoon the title of our paper is a study a study on motion sickness incidence at several position of a ship in regular waves irregular waves the motivation ship would be uh, ship motions have undesirable effect on on the crew while sailing through a rough, rough seas it causes motion sickness which uh, gradually becomes increasingly difficult to with it with a stunt and hampers the capability of of performing daily works the heaving pitching and rolling motions are the main cause of sea sickness during the voyage which causes a great amount of discomfort in the passenger vessels the aim of this research is to calculate motion sickness incidence index at different frequencies and different heading sick directions of indian vessels of bangladesh objective to understand to understand the motion sickness due to the due to the motions of the ships to determine the vertical motion sickness incidence index acceleration at, at distant positions in the ship when traveling at different sea and heading angles to calculate the motion sickness incidence at several position of the ship by calculating the rms motion amplitude velocity and acceleration then to predict the reasonable operating speed and heading conditions under which minimal motion sickness may be experienced to inspire motion sickness of inland vessels at initial ship design which is yet to be a common practice in bangladesh the methodology at first a monohull container ship which is operating in bangladesh was selected for our research purpose then the hull of the ship was generated by using a 3d modeling tool after that the hull was divided into a certain number of sections the beam length as well as the sectional area for each section was calculated from the model Now, then the hydrostatic properties of the model was calculated using an analysis tool on the model hydrodynamic coefficient for each section was found using lewis form method the hydrodynamic coefficient for the whole ship was found by using numerical integration methods acceleration force moments were calculated uh, from wave amplitude frequency data and ship characteristics following on a suitable wave spectrum was chosen for the particular sea where where the ship will operate the wave spectrum was transformed in the into a spectrum where wave frequency were replaced by the encountered frequency at the same time a plot was obtained where the ordinate represent the amplitude of motion and axis represent the encountered frequency which is generated on the uh, with the help of the calculated hydrodynamic coefficient acceleration force and moments following on the motion amplitude spectrum was obtained by multiplying multiplying the ordinates of the response amplitude operator spectrum and the ordinates of the encounter wave spectrum which help us to understand the motion characteristics in the particular sea wave these are the governing equation of the motion first one is the is for heaving second one is for rolling and third one is for pitching the method of calculation motion sickness in, index uh, uh, by using uh, using equation number 4 we calculated the our motion sickness index and then validated the result with the iso 26313 standard uh, 
the web web encounter spectrum for uh, for uh, for calculating the web nature spectrum uh, uh, by uh, by using equation number uh, six seven eight and nine we calculated we calculated the uh, we calculated the encounter spectrum vertical motion spectrum um, and the motion characteristics. Equation equation nine is used for calculating the uh, root mean square of the motion. Equation ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen are used for calculating the uh, armis velocity, armis acceleration, and as well as the velocity spectrum and acceleration spectrum. This is the uh, ISO two sixty one standard T one three standard, which is used for validating our result. Then case study to calculate the vertical acceleration at various location of the ship and uh, an inland container ship of 36 meter in length in Bangladesh has been selected of which the body plan and the part uh, but the body plan and the hydrostatic properties are given in table number one and figure three. These are the four locations where the motion signals index uh, will be calculated. Uh, and and the uh, conditions of the motion sickness analysis, uh, C and SP condition and heading condition, uh, we uh, we calculated we calculated the motion sickness index uh, in five heading conditions for uh, five speeds. Then the result and the discussions. Uh, in this four in this four graph, uh, the motion signal acceleration for several speeds in following C condition at location at location one two three and four as shown before uh, is is given according to these figures 10 percent of the crew will be will be exposed to the motion sickness for at least eight hours at a speed less or equal to 10 not per hour at location at location one and two when the speed speed is less than equal to five not per hour 10 percent of the crew will be exposed for at least two hours at location one and two when the speed is less than or equal to 2.5 knot per hour uh, per hour. No significant motion sickness is observed in location three and four. Similarly, at the stern quadrant C condition, we calculated the uh, motion sickness index for location one, two, and three. According to these figures, 10% of the crew will be exposed to motion sickness for at least at least eight hours at a speed less or equal to 10 knots per hour at location one and two. Uh, at the same location, when a speed less or equal to 7.5 knots. 5 knots, uh, 7.5 knots, 10% of the crew will be exposed for at least two hours and only location one experience sickness for 30 minutes at zero knot per hour. Similarly, at location three and four for uh, a stern quarter in C condition, we calculated the motion sickness index. Gradually in BMC condition for location one, two and three and four, we calculated the motion sickness index. Uh, then for uh, bow quadrant C condition, we again calculated the uh, motion sickness index at location one, two, three, and four. At the at the, at the last, we calculated the motion sickness index at head C condition for location one, two, three, and four. These are the polar uh, contour graph uh, of RMS heaving motion in the range of zero to one eighty degree for zero point uh, five four meter to. 1.1 meter, the harvest heat velocity and acceleration in the similar range from 0.247 meter per second to 0.905 meter per second. This is the uh, this is the uh, RMS graph for pitch motion, uh, pitch motion velocity and acceleration from uh, 0 to 180 degree. Then the RMS uh, RMS motion graphs for roll motion, roll uh, roll motion, roll velocity and acceleration up to any speed up to 10 knot uh, from 0 to 180 degree. These are the these are the general polar graph uh, for uh, for our, uh, heat, pitch and roll motions uh, for uh, heading angle 0 to 180 degree. And the conclusion. The research focus on the calculation of motion sickness acceleration with the help of a strip method and ISO 26313 standard for the encounter frequency range 0 to 2.5 radian per second because motion sickness is a common phenomenon in lower frequencies. It helps us to finding comfortable speed at different heading angles for avoiding motion sickness making use of the data gathered from this research the container ship can use the crow uh, with the help of the motion signal easily adjust the weight, dis weight distribution at the initial stage to ensure a comfortable journey for the crew thank you
thank you uh, i must congratulate all the young speakers i have at least learned lot of things from them and uh, actually <laughs> i would like to in a uh, separate mood i'd like to thank mohammad avid mahadi in case you were born 50 years back no you would have designed a ship where there will be no rolling pitching because i had to leave sea because of falling sea sick you know i was so i used to fall sea sick every now and then that's why i had to leave sea at the earliest so i mean someone like you would have de developed a ship where there will be less rolling pitching i had been still probably sailing so anyway and and another thing i would like to congratulate all of you that you have stuck to your timing that is something very good so now i would request mr k m rao to sort of conclude the session with his concluding remarks please mr k m rao uh, good afternoon sir thank you thanks for giving the speak uh, good afternoon to all uh, i think uh, all the speakers uh, from uh, shri wagmare shri hans bartag mr shomik datta mr jawad mr aish sharma and mr mohammad abir they have spent uh, a good amount of time for uh, preparing this papers and uh, really it is commendable and they have done a good job and the first presentation given by mr shri wagmare uh, he has uh, done a good job and uh, Mr. Walkmar, a subject was the what in water energy from the ocean, uh, oceans to propel ships. He has highlighted the area of green energy in ocean. Also, he has addressed the impacts of green energy. Generally, we don't bother about the impacts of uh, anything, but he has given that what are the impacts, especially in the marine animals, ecological systems, and organisms. It is a good thing. He has addressed. and also he said that uh, if you can recover 2% of tidal energy we can do a lot and we can get rid of this greenhouse gases emissions from this world and as we all know that imo has given a deadline for reduction of greenhouse gases 70% by 2050 and we have to get rid of the fossil fuels i think this is the one of the alternative energy to get rid of this fossil fuels and Mr. Hans uh, has uh, done a lot of job and regarding uh, hybrid underwater vehicles, and he has enlightened us the offshore sector how it works and how the underwater vehicles operations how it done, and it is really commendable and it is uh, enlightened us. And uh, the third presentation was the study of aerodynamic and cohesion and motion by Mr. Shomik Datta. a technical paper i has done good study on it uh, and uh, really it is all it is helpful to the, all the marine fertility this kind of papers will help us in future as well as mr javed uh, joker and also the distance and power predictions of different sh ship hulls and using numerical methods generally most of the engineers and the nautical uh, Uh, the especially the master mariners and chief officer they will not ever abo know about all these things but he has enlightened us and really good uh, good presentation but not uh, last uh, mr aish sharma on in a different uh, diversion and uh, he has given the economics of the shipping in fact uh, and uh, indian shipping what are the problems they were facing and how uh, the government is supporting what are the areas required to be supported to improve indian coastal shipping uh, really is good and he has taken the inputs from the various uh, uh, places and he has made a good presentation in fact we should all appreciate because at the end economics is the uh, main thing for the commercial shipping operations last but not least uh, mr mohammad abir uh, he has given a good study on the study in motion sickness uh, incidents several positions in irregular ways uh, as he said that our uh, pitra sir that uh, if you could have been uh, done this 50 years back uh, definitely most of the seafarers they will not leave the sea and uh, they will continue in the sea and uh, i am the one of the person i agree with that uh, thank you to all uh, thank you thanks for sparing so much of time and i uh, thank all the members who are participated in this session thank you thank you to all thank you. uh madnagar sir yeah i must uh,
thank uh, Mr. Mona Rao for being present here and you know he, he could spare uh, some time for the budding engineers uh, who had made some uh, good efforts to present uh, these papers uh, which have enlightened the entire audiences. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Rao. And uh, we look forward for uh, uh, the results uh, which will be announced in the last session, that is uh, during session 8, I believe. Uh, 3.30. 3.30 today, session 8 starts. 3.30, yeah. Definitely, definitely. By that time, we'll give you the results. Uh, uh, Fine. Definitely. Thank you. So, uh, with this, I think we are dot on time. Yeah. Two, three minutes uh, can still be managed. So, uh, we close uh, now for uh, lunch break and we will be back at 1400 IST. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I will not log out. The meeting is on. Means the yes, Zoom meeting, meeting is on. on. Yeah. But uh, everybody can rejoin at uh, 2 o'clock, 1400. Every day, finally we win. We go anchors away, cause I'm happy at sea, happy in the ocean place. Engine room and bridge, everything in its place. Sailed out safely, can't stop the smile on my face, cause I'm happy at sea, happy in the ocean place. All of my friends are on the same base, so I can't stop my smiling face, cause I'm happy at sea. Happy in the ocean place So smile, buddy, smile when the weather is good Smile when the weather rips off your hood Go so happy at sea, happy in the ocean place Smile, buddy, smile when the weather is good Smile when the weather rips off the hood Go so happy at sea in the ocean place Come on, smile while the going is good Better on the ship than on the log of wood Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in this ocean place Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in the ocean place Thank you!
क्या यही प्यार है हाँ यही प्यार है दिल तेरे बिन कहीं लगता नहीं वक्त गुजरता नहीं क्या यही कुछ और वजह इन बातों की लेकिन अब जाना कहा नींद गई मेरी रातों की चार तरता हूँ मैं भी चांद निकलता नहीं दिल तेरे दिन कहीं लगता नहीं गुजरता नहीं कैसे भूलूंगी
से दूर लहरों की राहों में लौट के आऊंगा फिर तेरी बाहों में थोड़ा इंतजार होगा दिल ये बेकरार होगा फिर एक होंगे हम तुम खुशियों की पनाहों में यारों का साथ है यहाँ सब ठाठ है पर माँ के हाथों की रोटी आती बड़ी याद है ये समंदर पे चलना बड़ा बेमिसाल है पर वो संग लॉन्ग ड्राइव उसके उसकी अपनी बात है थोड़ा इंतजार होगा दिल ये बेकरार होगा फिर एक होंगे हम तुम खुशियों की पनाहों में मेरी खुशकिस्मती मेरी दो जिंदगी धरती कहाँ चल भी और सागर की बंदगी एक तरफ शिव मेरा रिलेशनशिप वहाँ दोनों के लिए बराबर मेरी ये तृष्णगी थोड़ा इंतजार होगा दिल ये बेकरार होगा फिर एक होंगे हम तुम खुशियों की पनाहों में चल दिया तुझसे दू अपने घर की राहों में लौट के आऊंगा फिर तेरी बाहों में थोड़ा इंतजार होगा दिल ये बेकरार होगा फिर एक होंगे हम तुम लहरों की पनाहों में चल दिया राहों
बच्चे मम्मी मुझको कहते पापा भी मुझको ही कहते पेरेंट्स डे या कोई ओकेशन ये प्रेजेंट कभी नहीं रहते पियो की लाइन में कट रही उम्र ये मर जानी शिप्पे से रिलेशनशिप में फंस गई जवानी सौ बातें प्यारी प्यारी तू मुझसे कहती है आई नो दैट माई बेब वो सब सच ही रहती है सौ बातें प्यारी प्यारी तू मुझसे कहती है आई नो दैट माई बेब वो सब सच ही रहती है पर मेरी लाइफ है क्या शिप पर तुझको दिखा दो आ मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू डप होकर एबी पे जब सेल्फी लगाती है देख तुझे फिर डेक पे मुझे तेरी याद सताती है सबको लगता है शिप की लाइफ बहुत ही गिटरी है एडवेंचर यहाँ कैसे कैसे सब कुछ स्लिपरी है रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल चल मेरी रानी तुझको शिप की सैर करा दू तेरे मेरे बीच में लव का जो ब्रिज है हाँ है है रहता हूं ब्रिज पर तन्हा तन्हा दैट्स वेरी मैडनिंग तू मेरी लाइफ की लाइफ बोट है तू ही एंकर है शिप और रिलेशनशिप दोनों जरूरी करते दोनों मैटर हैं आ तुझको मैं क्वार्टर डेक पर पाड़ी करा दू मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू ओ माय बेब तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल चल मेरी रानी तुझको शिप की सैर करा दू
the sailor girl What better it could be Let me tell you mates Badli meri zindagi The end night parties Karke masti aluti Got my parents from her Seek her discipline duty I married the sailor girl Wo to lagti hai beauty Her uniform makes a gorgeous I say she is a cutie Oh yes sailor girl She's a sailor The sailor girl, she gets loads of money Lifestyle have better Penta Gucci or Armani She works outside, I stay at home Arrangement of money Wo bani hai ka to mein bana hu uski ki I married the sailor girl, she gets loads of money We have the best of life, it is rosy and sunny Oh yes sailor girl, oh yes sailor girl Married se lagal wo dunia ghoom ke aayegi Pyaari si adao se wo kisse sunayegi Missing her so much I hope ke jaldi aayegi I married the se lagal what better it could be Let me tell you mates badli meri zindagi She's a se lagal oh yeah se lagal She's a wonder girl, she's a sailor girl
फंस गई रे देखन जाओ थोड़ी शॉपिंग भी कर आओ ऐसे सीट लिटिल से सपने मैं मन में रोज सजाओ पर आते ही फेर दे ये खुशियों पे पानी शिप से रिलेशनशिप में फंस गई जवानी मैं लहरों से टकराऊ तूफानों को सह जाऊ सी सिकनेस को भी मैं तो मार के दूर भगाऊ मेरी टेंशन समझ थोड़ा मैनेज कर रानी शिप और रिलेशनशिप में फंस गई जवानी शिप और रिलेशनशिप में फंस गई जवानी
से भूलूंगी तू याद हमेशा आएगा तेरी जाने से जीना मुश्किल हो जाएगा अब कुछ भी हो दिल पे कोई जोर तो चलता नहीं Can't stop my smiling face Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in the ocean place So smile, buddy, smile When the weather is good Smile when the weather rips off your hood Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in the ocean place Smile, buddy, smile When the weather is good Smile on the weather rips off the hood Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in the ocean place Come on smile while the going is good Better on the ship than on the log of wood Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in this ocean place Cause I'm happy at sea Happy in the ocean place Thank you.
बच्चे मम्मी मुझको कहते पापा भी मुझको ही कहते पेरेंट्स डे या कोई ओकेशन ये प्रेजेंट कभी नहीं रहते भी की लाइन में कट रही उम्र ये मर जानी शिप से रिलेशनशिप में फंस गई जवानी सौ बातें प्यारी प्यारी तू मुझसे कहती है आई नो दैट माई बेब वो सब सच ही रहती है सौ बातें प्यारी प्यारी तू मुझसे कहती है आई नो दैट माई बेब वो सब सच ही रहती है पर मेरी लाइफ है क्या शिप पर तुझको दिखा दो आ मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू तू डेडअप होकर एबी पे जब सेल्फी लगाती है देख तुझे फिर डेक पे मुझे तेरी याद सताती है सबको लगता है शिप की लाइफ बहुत ही गिटरी है एडवेंचर यहाँ कैसे कैसे सब कुछ स्लिपरी है सीख भी पिला दू आ मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल चल मेरी रानी तुझको शिप की सैर करा दू तेरे मेरे बीच में लव का जो ब्रिज है हॉट एन हैपनिंग है रहता हूँ ब्रिज पर तन्हा तन्हा दैट्स वेरी मैडनिंग है तू मेरी लाइफ की लाइफ बोट है तू ही एंकर है शिप और रिलेशनशिप दोनों जरूरी करते दोनों मैटर है आ, तुझको मैं क्वार्टर डेक पर पाड़ी करा दू मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल मेरी रानी तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू ओ माय बेब तुझको मैं शिप की सैर करा दू चल चल मेरी रानी तुझको शिप की सैर करा दू
लफ्जों में तू मेरे नगमों में तू रमहों में तू मेरे सपनों में तू दुनिया मेरी है वही तू है जहा speakers mr rais danda part and captain solanki captain solanki is still to join uh, the the papers that we submitted will be available in the uh, journal already published in the journal the link has been shared also
we we have the merchant shipping act uh, upgradation so all of us can share some points there what views we have uh, mr danda part has just logged in Captain Sudhir, Subedar will be speaking extempore. Okay. So only Captain Indar will be Solanki still to join. Uh, uh, Captain Datta, I, I I have a presentation to make. Okay, okay I, sir. I I will make you the co-host. Then I will make you the co-host. I was made to understand you will be speaking extempore. But uh, what? Uh, no, I, 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 to the organizers, I have sent the presentation also. Okay, uh, okay, okay. I have made you the co-host, sir. Banerji sir and Bhatnaga sir. Set, yes, set. I I am set. Uh, somebody to introduce uh, the three speakers. Yes, I will do that. Yeah. Second second day Saturday afternoon. <laughs> uh, not many people have chosen other ways to spend after, time after four. <laughs> we have to send a reminder to captain solanki marriage sir uh, good afternoon sir Just we'll wait for about five minutes. Uh, still, only twenty participants. I'll uh, just remind Captain Solanki. Anuji sir, namaskar. Namaskar, namaskar. Long time no see. Or how did you see? Tell us. Because you are in a more enterprising place as compared to us. You you are in the city of joy. Uh, my favorite, our favorite place. Purani yade, बहुत ताजा हैं कलकत्ता की. Yes, but joy doesn't bring business, you know, which 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 Bombay brings. Uh, The topic of the afternoon is all all at your doorstep, sir. आप आप आपका bus चले तो बारा B bus जैसे I W T काम करता हूँ. Very well said. How are you keeping otherwise, sir? All well, sir. चलिए good good. We are keen anxiously waiting to hear you also. मेरा तो वही पुरानी record है क्या करें? Whatever it is, whatever it is. I keep repeating and repeating and repeating. One day I hope it will sink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the biggest thing is that you are very forthright. Yeah. 
अब डर मेरे आपसे डरता था अब डरने का जमाना खत्म हो गया नहीं डरने का तो सवाल ही नहीं है ये पहले मैंने सुन रहा हूँ किसी, किसी ने मुझे डरता था <laughs> सुन के भी अच्छा लग रहा हो आपको <laughs> नहीं नहीं बिल्कुल नहीं हम कभी नेवर हर्ड एनीबॉडी स्केयर्ड ऑफ मी दैट इज ऑल आर्टिफिशियल यू नो उस मन, उस मंदिर में जो जाते हैं वहां पे उस मंदिर से हमको डर लगता है तो हम क्या करें आई नो दैट इज दैट इज दैट इज मोर ऑफ नोशन यू नो इन 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 माय इन माय अर्ली डेज सर ड्यूरिंग सीयूसी एग्जाम्स सो देर वर टू रेड बिल्डिंग्स प्रोमिनेंट इन कलकत्ता वन वाज द एमएमडी एंड वन वाज द राइटर्स बिल्डिंग ऑल पेंटेड रेड इन कलर Yeah. So yeah. So we were scared of both the buildings that time. Right. Yeah, right. MMT. MMT is true. MMT is a darne ka jaga hai. But DG shipping darne wala the kuch nahi hai because DG is always with the industry. So CS and NA they follow accordingly. एस टी सी डब्ल्यू नाइन्टी फाइव के बैनर्जी साहब कलकत्ता में पीओ थे मैं लंदन से वापस लौटा था सात आठ साल के बाद बैनर्जी साहब ने बिरयानी बिरयानी करके मेरी खातिर की थी और उस समय एस टी और फिर बाद में आप चेन्नई गए तो वहां भी वही कार्यक्रम हुआ प्रोपोगेटिंग इफ यू रिकॉल प्रोपोगेटिंग एस टी सी डब्ल्यू नाइन्टी फाइव चेंजेस Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Which compared to twenty twenty ten, I had a large role to play in. last session before the validity session is the session 7 on inland water transport and the session chairman for this session is captain vidut banerji we have three speakers in this uh, first is captain uh, subedar i will be speaking on the iwt opportunities and problems to reduce logistics cost second uh, speaker is mr s dandapat he will be speaking on the indo bangladesh protocol on inland water trade transit navigation system in northeast part of the indian subcontinent and the last speaker is captain indarvit solanki uh, his paper is on the augmenting capacity of waterways maneuvering perspective so i have the pleasure of introducing the chair chairman for this session captain vidut kuna uh, kumar banerji afni afni he completed his pre sea training from ts rajendra in 1980 one and served with sindhya steam navigation till 1988 thereafter he served with many reputed companies and is completed his masters fg in 91 and got command in 95 uh 
he has for the past 25 years commanded modern and very large cellular container ships from time to time about 35 command tenures calling at over 1074 ports his motto is a stitch in time saves nine that is the scarce resources need more careful planning deployment and monitoring he is qualified as an lrqa lead auditor 2007 and is registered as an independent director in the database of indian institute of corporate affairs so over to you captain bidud manerji for chairing the session and giving your opening uh, remarks uh, thank you uh, thank you captain datta uh, we have this session on the inland waterway uh, tra uh, waterway transport and uh, three speakers i don't have their synopsis so i'll be listening to them and uh, what views they have and what they bring to the table and uh, at the end of the session we'll sum it up so uh, this is a great opportunity to see the diverse topics uh, being covered and knowledge being shared experiences being shared so it has been a wonderful uh, experience so far for the last 2 3 days so without wasting any time i will ask captain subedar uh, to please uh, uh, put his paper but before that i think uh, captain subedar needs to be introduced because you have the details for, for him uh yes, um, yes thank you i would like to welcome uh, captain subedar he is a former ceo ixa past president of the indian coastal conference shipping association he is the member of the national organizing core committee for first international ship masters congress he is engaged in the business of development of incentive incentive scheme for model shift of cargo he is an imo impaneled consultant he is the director of uh, supath engineering services limited chairman of the ram ram janki inter college trust kanpur member academic council tolani maritime college pune the warden and mentor and ex founder president of the company of master mariners pune chapter he is a member of regulatory authority government of india to enhance its logistic sectors inland water transport institutions he is a member of the water impact project of sea ganga for sustainable navigation rivers ministry of jal shakti is ex director of indian national ship owners association ex director of ocean sparkle group of companies hyderabad he was the osd dg shipping in from 98 to 2000 for stcw 95 implementation ism and auditing he is the technical officer of imo he was a superintendent in sci mumbai and anglo eastern hong kong from 82 to 89 officer and sailing master of sci in anglo eastern from 1968 to 1982 he is the member of governing council of logistic skill council chennai and is an active rotarian also uh, i would now request captain subeda to give his presentation over to you sir thank you thank you captain datta <coughs> banerji saab vidyut distinguished delegates ladies and gentlemen <clears throat> can you see the uh, shared screen uh, uh no, no sir no okay. not as yet जाइए जूम 
जूम यहाँ से करिए ना शेयर स्क्रीन आई हैव मेड यू द कोर्स सर सो यू कैन शेयर डबल क्लिक कि फील क्यों नहीं Is it is it visible now? No. Ah, uh, no, Not sir. Not as yet. Sir, you have to open it first. Uh, that program on your. Uh, I I I did that. I did that, Captain. Uh, computer and then uh, share the screen. Uh, selecting that. Can Can you see it now? Ah, uh, no, sir. Not yet, come, sir. क्या कह रहा है मिस्टर सुधीर देयर इज अ बटन कॉल डाउन बिलो देयर इज अ बटन कॉल शेयर स्क्रीन जस्ट प्रेस दैट वंस यू प्रेस दैट यू विल गेट एन ऑप्शन अ डायलॉग बॉक्स विल ओपन द डायलॉग बॉक्स यू कैन सी व्हिच स्लाइड ऑफ पीपीटी यू वांट टू ओपन जस्ट क्लिक ऑन दैट सर एंड इट विल ऑटोमेटिकली बी शेयर्ड आई डिड दैट इट सेज शेयरिंग स्क्रीन फेल्ड एंड गिव सम काइंड ऑफ अ I I I am turning the slides now. They are turning in front of me, but I guess you are not getting to see it. Again, try to share it, sir. Uh, again, try to share it. Okay. It is showing some error. Uh, can you uh, reboot, uh, giving me the host? Okay, I will do that, sir. Hmm? Okay, sir. I have rebooted and made you co-host again. देखो. Uh, is Mr. Bhatnagar around? Because I I shared the PPT with them also and with the organizers also. So if somebody else can upload it. Okay, sir. I'll just have a uh, Bhatnagar, sir. One 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 moment. Ah, huh? let me open his PPT. Yeah, I I've got his uh, PPT presentation. I, I'm just sharing that. Thanks. Sir. Is it visible now? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, so I'll be I'll be using my uh, my slides and uh, uh, you you can tell me, sir, when when you want slide to be changed. Yeah. Maybe you have to do a little extra work. I'll I'll change slide. Yeah. I will I will just say next and then you could do that, please. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so, then uh, is up. Uh, starting again, uh, the first slide yes. is uh, is um, uh, is setting the stage uh, for the proposed uh, my topic. 
uh, I have been introduced. Thank you, uh, Captain Jatta, for that. Uh, next. Uh, ESCAP is a United Nations uh, body which over five years, every five years takes stock of the situation of various sectors, including shipping. And what you see on the uh, screen now is the pending strategy points in our part of the world since 2017. Uh, I can comfortably say that most of these have been pending for one or the other reasons which reach the highest levels of the government but do not trickle down at the ground level and therefore we have a mismatch of country boards in Assam, country boards in Kol Kolkata, Maji and the cadre and the shape and the capacity you can see it says right mix of ship types, payloads and space and sea leg distance. They are all simple things which are continuing to be pending. The similar report was in 2012 and I recall way back during my tenure in London that Captain Barve was nominated to represent India at the ESCAP in Malaysia then and the report has consistently been similar which I picked up here from last three four reports. So that's bas next. That's basically trying to say that not much has changed I would say since 1985 when the authority was created. The first five years, of course, were only setting up. So let us say at least from 1990 to today, uh, the kind of picture that we would like to see in at least the five national waterways, forget the 111 that have been added by the Waterways Act. Neither the building of such craft for which India has had a long history of maritime heritage of building ships and craft for foreigners. But this kind of barge taking one tier containers is still not happened. Neither there is make in India and made in India, for example, for suction dredgers, which are most suitable for alluvial river, river soil. And I believe that this kind of equipment, this kind of Atma Nirbharta would be best demonstrated on the stretches of the Ganges to begin with. Innovation, although not, not part of that strategy, that such a word did not re reach there. But given that LNG or solar powered inland vessel boats, vessels, ships, whatever we call it, is just around the corner waiting for appropriate time to commission them. It is quite often said that shipping is derived demand. I agree with that, but I think there is a need for demand creation as well. And the regional connectivity which IWT system will bring at least in the part where, where we all are virtually sitting. Is well established network which is not being leveraged either from Allahabad to Calcutta, Kolkata or Kolkata to Guwahati 
and to the northeast. Mr. Dandapat will enlighten us on the status of Indo-Bangladesh protocol, which has come in place, but there is paucity of traffic, two-way traffic. There is some traffic from Bangladesh to India, but very little from India to Bangladesh. My submission is that mainly it is because of conservatism on this side of the fence and the lack of suitable fleet for the purpose. Next. In 2013, when I was in chair, the then minister and NSB chairman, with the help of industry commission, KPMG, to make a study of the difficulties, cost differentials of inland waterways or in coastal shipping in particular. While the technology and engineering would tell us that without, for, without friction in the water or in the fluid, water transport is 30% cheaper by, by, by all counts. It is the first mile and the last mile connectivity and the neglect of the sector for that, doing that. KPMG pointed out after study of nine, nine voyages, nine commodities, that there is actually a cost differential between land transport and water transport to approximately to the tune of rupees 500 per kilometer ton. The report went on to suggest to the government certain some kind of support, incentive being a bad word in this government. <laughs> So although Kerala has taken and perhaps doing well, but little differently than what the report KPMG said, the incentive was to be given to owner operator rather than to cargo people, which is what Kerala model is doing. And India, uh, the government of India hasn't uh, taken much notice of that yet. Is that they're incentivizing in Kerala, which is about 500 miles of the coast, to reduce traffic on the road for various reasons. And they have a good backwaters to achieve that. But that is not that has not yet added to Captain Philip Matthews of lot shipping. It has not added to ship shipbuilding capacity. It has not added. This will not happen because the cargo owner is not going to pass it on for the ship owner to be facilitated or strengthen his hands to make more fleet of suitable size and shapes. Next. This, this slide and we heard yesterday Dave Goswami point out over regulation has been rampant in shipping particularly. This government took over charge in 2014, October, Honorable Prime Minister almost ordered comprehensive revision of all colonial acts, rules, regulations and practices. Much has been done, 370 gone for example, but our sector which interests Myself, Mr. Banerjee and the participants just now hearing this presentation. 2015 October, the first draft of MS Act is still to see light of the day. Just a couple of days ago, another, I don't, I now forget the number of revisions, third or fourth revision is under circulation. But I think it is the next slide, sir. Uh, Bhatnagar, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, go ahead, sir. The 
the title of the slide is background because i am talking about the, uh, the the route that is being taken by the four or five maritime acts the multimodal transport act which was dg shipping matter has now gone to ministry of uh, commerce you know where i was special secretary logistics and he is talking about a logistic law but does not mention anything about inland water in that i fail to understand where is the hitch if comprehensive transport policy and transport acts brings in iwt water transport at the at the core of this legislation take another example of the fourth merchant shipping act draft that is under circulation and the fraternity has given whenever requested tabulated comments but very little has been taken on board for example river sea vessel does not find place even in the definition section similar thing is happening with the ports being a state subject and a center subject we have, some of us have re recommended that there should be only one ports act with perhaps one part for the 12 central government ports and one for the others now we have a major port authority act which does not pay any attention to inland water transport we have the ports act which does not pay any attention to the inland water transport we have inland vessel act which has also gone two or three revisions it was followed by model rules of implementation because it is a state subject almost no state took it on board except gujarat tried a little bit net result is that inland vessel act now has detail almost equal to rules which is not a good thing because a common man wanting to enter or invest into inland water transport is not going to be bothered with 170 pages of central act to be implemented by the state government so this is the background uh, we are uh, losing sight of the opportunities which are immense next sir and is just a uh, slide on slide on uh, statistics uh, actual waterways under operation are about 16 uh, less than 2% carriage etc uh, it, it is intended to by 2024 to become 120 million tons uh, least available depth infrastructure status still all work in progress next sir sir you will have a few couple of minutes more to sum yes up. yes so uh, so please uh, i'm i'm going faster on the slides because some of them are visible so you can uh, no need for me to speak uh, what is already there iwt opportunities um, is the name of the slide so making inland water transport as simple as possible is the need of the hour next all the advantages of doing that road congestion lesser uh, better carbon footprint Uh, lesser road accident insurance claims which turn up to 50000 crores per annum etc would make any iwt proposal if sub, if implemented in the right spirit a win win situation next the action plan for doing this is to reduce middle agencies far too many middle agencies for example customs and immigration have no role in domestic shipping next Re reliable water transport 
closer to the user, which is perhaps IT technology can do, Sagarmala can do, bringing water closer to, and Indian vessels for Indian use is, I believe, the engineering challenge. We need to attract investment by making substantial forays into matching nine or 10 bulk commodities, oversized cargo, dangerous cargo to be carried only by water transport. Gadkiri ji tried his level best to create a PPP model which has been very successfully been able to do in the road sector, but it has not worked either in the port and is not working in the inland water transport sector. Public private partnership is only possible when the terms of the agreement are equally balanced for both the government and the private party. There is a document now still under consideration is called the Maritime Vision Document 2030, which is committing 250,000 crore fund out of which 10% government of India is willing to put it in the next financial budget. Uh, how it will be deployed and if IWI can snatch little bit of that and deploy it towards creating the carrier, which is the most essential element missing in the IWT transport. Then there are certain things like fiscal customs duty, uh, immigration charges, port charges. These are all hindrances to a robust and vibrant inland water transport as we see in Inland Sea of Japan, in uh, European Union, United Kingdom, etc. Another fiscal item to be studied is the FDI 100% allowed in shipping for last ten, for last 10 years has not taken off. So there's a gap analysis required to be done. Why the FDI 100% is not getting attractive. In Namami Gange, uh, there was a mention during my, uh, when I was introduced, I have been able to put forward the idea and it has gone into the Arth Ganga now that water is for drinking river water that is irrigation and navigation so the word navigation has featured in the earth program earth ganga and uh, one hopes that together with the 250000 crore uh, national maritime fund the manregas and the jnr ums these all could be utilized uh, to augment the uh, carrying capacity of the inland water transport on a policy level the, on autobahns in Germany, for example, no carrier is allowed to be on the autobahn from Friday evening to Monday morning so that the autobahn is free for the leisure seekers. That gives an indirect flip to the water transport system of the Rhine River. Another case point, point is the overloading that is prevalent on Indian road and rail, which I cannot do because of the Archimedes principle. So that's Checking that, synergizing that, making both freights converge to each other, HSC, I have to do a MARPOL, I have to do PCB, I have to do all these things, but my, my competitor doesn't seem to have any of those restrictions. So that's a policy shift that would help. Uh, this just shows the advantage of the water transport uh, over road and rail, uh, one third capacity, uh, can be carried at less fuel, etc. The new IV Act is in under progress, like I said, and therefore I would request the panel panelists and the delegates to please help us persuade the government to review the new IV Act so that it is not burdensome on the investor and the operator. The new, the new IV Act should be enabler and simple. The state-centric 
a thought should not be carried out, should not be driven out of that act, not centralized as it is intending to be done, should be applicable pan-India, seamless integration of coastal exim and the IWT sectors, We have to usher in, I would say, what I, in Hindi would be Mulbhut Savida, is all that the Indian operator is looking, whether it in Varanasi or in Kolkata or in Guwahati, where I go quite often. Uh, the, the emphasis on infrastructure, meaning civil engineering, is not necessary. What we need is carrier centric Suvidas so that cargo can be brought there and taken from A to B. I hope that in by 2022-24, we have more players in the IWT sector, which means more seafarers, more seafarers of the IV cutter, more business for the strong economy that India is looking for. And that should at least give, if nothing else, tangential benefit of a better carbon footprint, which Mr. Banerjee would love to have. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Captain Subida, sir, your uh, detailed analysis and uh, very uh, clearly we can see you have been in this field for long and dedicated your time and energy at various levels. Uh, after the three papers are done, we will sum it up. So I will request the... Uh, yes, the next speaker is uh, Mr. S. Dandapat for the topic on Indo-Bangladesh protocol on inland water trade transit navigation system in northeast part of Indian subcontinent. I would like to introduce him. Mr. Subhakar Dandapat has a B.Tech honors degree on naval architecture from IIT Khadakpur in the year 1979 and MSc on ship production technology from Strathclyde University, Glasgow, UK in the year 1983. Starting his career in 1979 as a naval architect from Hindustan shipyard, Mr. Nandapat joined inland water transport. And as the post-retirement assignment, he has been associated with Adani Port and SEJ Private Limited and Messrs. How Engineering Project India Private Limited since September 2016 and continuing till date. He is a member to various professional organizations which are Institution of Naval Architecture, Mumbai, member of Eastern Dredging Association, India, Hyderabad, Bureau of Indian Standards, member to Technical Committee of Indian Register of Shipping, Mumbai, member to the working group for the conservation of petroleum products in inland water transport sector, member to the working group constituted by Government of India for amendment of Inland Vessel Act of 1917, member to the committee constituted during 2011 to 2015 for formulation of model rules and regulation under the provision of Inland Vessels Act of 1917 for adoption by state governments. Member to the committee constituted by Government of Kerala for formulation of rules and regulation for inland vessels survey and registration as per IV Act 1917. Member to the committee for drafting new inland vessels act during 2014 to 2016 for replacing existing act after its enactment by the Parliament of India. Member to an expert group committee constituted by NMDA that is the National Disaster Management Authority for recommendation on the legal and regulatory aspect, aspect on the safety during the operation of country, country crafts in inland waters. And member to the board of KNINC, KSNINC, Kerala State Inland Navigational Corporation and undertaking of the Kerala government during 2006 to 2009. Over to you, uh, Mr. Dandapat, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Dutta. Uh, in fact, 
you are the course sir you can share your presentation uh can you see my presentation yes sir Repeat. yeah in that time grateful to organizers of isco giving me a chance to say some things on inland water transport and i must say some things to captain sugadhar also with whom i have worked for inland vessel act which we are going to i mean already finalized and it is be placed before the parliament most probably it is supposed to be placed this year only but it has got delayed due to covid only and i begin the presentations on protocol on inland motor transport and its importance for a vibrant inland navigation systems in the north east part of the indian subcontinent because this is the most important part of the national water I mean, navigation systems which will make the futures of inland water systems in india also before i start i must say that before the independence the inland navigations in ganga jamun ganga brahmaputra and magna river systems was flourishing and it continued till 1947 after that oil east pakistan and india got separated it continued with the protocols till 1965 and after 65 to 71 till the independence of bangladesh there was no movement of the vessels and the things was impounded movement was suspended after the 71 while the trade pact agreement was signed in march 1971 and followed by article 188 on past number 1971 it's protocol of this piwt that is protocol on inland water Tran transit and trade was signed on first november 1971 with six routes and six ports of call with validity for the two years and this validity of two years continued till 2011 with intermediate there was no renewals even if there was a renewal it was only for six months sometimes even one um, one year only after 2001 it continued regularly for up for two years up to 2015 while our honorable prime minister visited bangladesh uh, during 2015 the <coughs> protocol was renewed for five years with the provisions for auto renewals every five years and the second renewals has been done on sorry first renewals in five years was done on 20th in 2020 with declarations of two more routes and extension of the existing five and six and today we have 10 routes of 1654 kilometers out of which 869 kilometers in india and 785 kilometers in bangladesh each country has 10 ports of call and two extended ports of call asuganj and sherpur are the transit ports biwt in bangladesh is the local agency for implementation of this protocol this biwt means this bangla inland water transport bangladesh inland water transport authority and indian side cwtc continued from 1971 till 2013 and thereafter iwi has taken over uh in the nodal agencies and iwt operators were the earlier the river steam navigation rgnr joint steamers navigation company these are british companies subsequently this river steam navigation was merged i mean uh, converted to cw with the tech was taken over as a uh, government of india enterprises and from bangladesh side biwtc and there a huge number of private operators are at the moment participating from indian side the private operators hardly six six or seven are on a regular basis and 
balance 20 or 10 switch who have been registered with IWIS, they do occasionally. The main features protocol is the cargo has to be on 50-50 share basis, deployment of the vessel also will be the 50-50 with common trade rate. Now these are the ports of Pol, Bangladesh and India. Status of movement. Uh, details on the trade movements are available from 2001 on. 2001, it, it, the total amount of cargo moved was 1.06 lakh, and 2007 and 8 onwards with the decline distributions between the ex, export and in 2007 it was 9.95 lakhs total. And out of that export was 9.95 and import was only 15,000. And 2019 and 20, it has increased to 27.8 lakhs. The total, this is a bilateral cargo. I mean, and export is 27.8, whereas the import is almost nil. The fleet deployment in 2001 and 2 was 50 is to 45. I mean, that means 55% was from Indian side, 45 in Bangladesh. Now it is Indian side has reduced to four percent, and whereas the Bangladesh side has increased to ninety-five point five. Commodities are basically the flyers, which constitute ninety-five percent of total stone chips and boulders is three percent, and food grains project and the rest of the things is around one to two percent. The, the figures gives the Examples of the number of trips by investors, the Bangladeshi vessels. And this is about the tra transit cap. I mean, if you see the foot wise that Calcutta, Dobri, or Pandu, or the Pandu, Calcutta, then Asugans, that is very, very heretical. In sometimes it was even some of the routes like uh, route number three and four, the movement is almost nil. And the commodities which are uh, but at the moment, we can only the odyssey, odyssey of generators, machineries, machine parts, construction equipment, steel products, coal, food grains, and containers. Even though there is I mean, small, I mean, very, very poor utilization of the uh, protocol routes, still there is a strategic interest of India on PIWTD, mostly on account of the chicken corridor, chicken neck corridor at the Siliguri, because which connects to all the seven states. The, the rest one is the seven, second one is the BBIN, that is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal cooperation with the agreement, um, motor vehicle agreements. So that, yeah, in government of India and Bangladesh desires that there should also be multiple systems to have only the road sectors. And the third one is the activist policy under the ASEAN summit, also BIMSTEC, the BCIM, Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar, and then also SRG special uh, groups, which starts from Calcutta up to the province in China. And strategic interest of India is also on account of the steady growth of bilateral trade. Increased Indian investment, which is now at the moment 3.1 billion and expected to rise up the US dollar by 9 billion. Assistance under LOC 1, LOC 2, LOC 3, which was in LOC 2010, LOC 2002, and LOC. 2018, the it is comes to around eight billion. Indian investment is mainly on the projects of infrastructures, power, energy, shippings, SEJs, medical, med, and healthcare and educations. And in most of the investors are the our public sectors and private sectors, ONGCs, IOCs, in LNG, power sectors. Concur is also there. Uh, they are building up one. Power sectors of the um, Saibganj near Saibganj. Mm 
to strengthen PIW teams, lot of uh, other agreements and MOU have been signed. One of that was the agreement on the coastal shipping between India and Bangladesh. Uh, under this, six coastal ports, I mean, eastern coastal ports have been added up. And similarly, the six on the Bangladeshi sites, here all the river sea vessels of starting from RSB 3, 4, 3, 2, even 1 also can operate in this uh, designated routes. And second one is the MOU for the MOU for the use of the Chittagong and Mangla ports for movement of goods to and from India, that is up to Agarwala and Dawaki by waterways, rail, road, and multimodal transports. Uh, there is one, one MOU for passenger ferry and cruise vessels movement between both the countries. Uh, pilot, I mean, trial have been already conducted last year. And no, some, um, this year, the regular service was supposed to be started, but because of uh, COVID, everything has been disrupted. Then agreement for developing a transit port at Asugans for personal handling and transshipment is one of the major developments. Already the construction work is going on. Strategic interest from Bangladesh side is the steady growth of GDP, which has started 6.2 in 2000. Now it has gone up to, up to 8.2. Rapid industrializations. Phenomenal growth of the RMG, that is uh, um, ready-made garment sectors, the demand for import of fabrics, then 100 export zones, 15 special economic zones, all of these two are devoted only for the depth. steady growth of trade and commerce. Hence, there is a demand for the safe and cheap alternate transport mode through inland navigation to India and others. Also, they have interest because of the potential for increased revenue on transit and waterways, fish, logistics and services, employment generations. Traffic projections and potentials for this, already three studies have been conducted. Unnest and Young Private Limited, Engineering and, and IMRA Private Limited. And it shows that there is a huge percentage of divertible cargo from railroad to IWT sector. If I can give you the, some examples, the food grains, cements, fertilizers, bitumens, flyers, edible oil, imported coal, fuel products, stone chips, automobiles, these are the divertible cargo from the Siliguri, Siliguri corridor to IWT sectors. The other one was done by the Huawei Engineering. The mostly the flyers, stone chips, and onions, and others. Both legislations of the IVP routes are attributed to the of fairway with adequate water depths, mainly on the transit routes. The transit routes are from uh, Narangans or Dhaka side to up to uh, Dobri, that is on the Jammu rivers, and also in the Magna river system from Asugans to Karimgans, uh, around 175 kilometers, and the other one is up to 200 kilometers. And lack of suitable navigation facilities mostly on the transit routes. Total Terminal infrastructures, including multimodal terminals, transit ports, fast and last mile activities, or absence in most of the protocols, inadequate return cargo from Northeast returns, and when in and Bangladesh, no measures against navigational and security hazards in the no man's land near to Chilmari and Dubri, customer friendly customs and Clearance procedure, suitable policy frameworks, regulation for sustainable development of the navigation systems is almost absent. No cargo promotions. There is tariff and uh, tariff barriers also. Mismatch on standards of the fleet with respect to the constructions, manning, safety equipment, and measures between the both the countries. 
and inadequate efficient and economical vessels deployments on the protocols then important projects under uh, executions are under the bilateral assistance the dredging operations is going on as well depth basis in the transit routes in jamuna that is sirajganj to daigwa for 200 kilometers it is for the seven years uh, depth is to maintain for 2.5 meters along with the night navigation facilities and in Meghna river systems it is from uh, Asuganj to Karimganj and, um, and finance part government of India is contributing 80% and Bangladesh is 20% then transshipment hub the container terminal and associate handling equipment at Asuganj is under construction was supposed to be completed this year uh, but this project government of India is contributing almost the entire 100% and then 30 kilometers uh, stretch of pole and road facilities from Asugans to Akbar borders with further rail, rail link from Akwara to Agartala providing the connectivity to northeastern frontier railway is um, constructions. Then proposal for developing the Primganj its transshipment is already in the pipelines, dredging for 5, 6, and 9, 10, these two routes also will be done by Government of India under the bilateral assistance. Developing of suitable terminals at Maya is already in the TPS stage. Sonamura, some floating management has been done. Development of the inland continuous terminals are in Bangladesh through the uh, Indian investors already under progress. Then coastal ports also, that Mangala port, Government of India has already financed. And capacity augmentations of the NW to the river Brahmaputra is being taken up. Already it has been rendered. One is similar to the NW ones through World Bank projects. Then World Bank funded projects in Bangladesh. 360 million US dollars has already been invested for the improvement of fairways, terminal infrastructures on Dhaka Chittagong corridors, then Asuganj Dhaka corridors, as well as their field routes in N1 because this will come together. I mean, it will provide this facility. That's why I'm giving all these examples. As noted, number one, all 375 million dollars, that means 5,365 roads each under investment from Haldia to Baranas streets of uh, the, the waterways, then Assam Indian water projects, $88 million is pumped out, I mean pumped in for modernizing the inland ferry systems, West Bengal, intermodal logistics and transports on inland water projects for US dollar, 100 million has been sanctioned and this has already been tendered. Probably next year onward, this work will start work in the sense the study of I many project will be prepared will be and ready and and prepared. Then apart from that, another 70 million US dollar has been sanctioned for development of the Eastern National Waterways Grid. With with the intention of improving con connectivity from Saib Ganj multimodal terminal to Jhagi Gopa multimodal logistic port and Asugans crew and Asugans transshipment. Yes, uh, Mr. Dandapat, I would request you to summarize in the next few minutes. Uh, yeah, another two three purposes. Uh, then, futuristic policy and regulations for developing and to a sustainable inland waters. The revival of the Jangipur navigation law is already <coughs> taken up. Bangladesh is also interested, government of India is also interested, but our government has already set up a committee to study whether it is feasible or not feasible with the point of the water sharings. Then integrated national waterways transport system grids. This was studied around 2013 with four national waterways, that times the total with the national waterways number one, number two, number five, that is in that uh, 
east coast canals with manadi and brahmani river systems and ba barak along with protocols that times the total length was around 4850 and now <clears throat> with the decreasing of uh, six, six more waterways if we combine all these waterways whatever uh, the tributaries of Ma Ma ganga and brahmaputra that Length will be around nine thousand five hundred fifty, and it will be a huge one. The digitizations already in most of the world worldwide is taken place in Hyderabad also from two thousand twenty. I mean this year after the COVID started, it has been more or less taken as a um, extra curricular. I mean extra activities and twenty. Apps, different types of apps have been taken um, already formulated. So, this digitization should also be uh, taken considered for this uh, Indian navigation systems. For, um, the edge to navigation should be improved. Then, river information systems IW has already taken up the uh, phase one. The phase two, they are taking. They are taking up during the Jalmal Vikas project in the uh, maybe next year onward it may start for installation. And then third stage would be taken up for e-governance in futures. Institutional strengthening and capacity buildings. For IWP and BIWT is absolutely necessary. Then cargo promotion measures. There are a lot of cargo prom uh, promotional measures have been already suggested. If these are taken up, then definitely there will be a lot of improvements. Um, improved safety measures is absolutely necessary. Similarly, the deployment of the fuel efficient, economic, and green fleets. Are necessary at this stage. Reverse vessels, other than uh, whatever comes under this uh, coastal shippings, can be started from sandheads, conical sands, Dhamra port, even um, Cal Calcutta port, or even the Haldia multimodal ter terminal, which is coming up. Then simplification and rationalization of the regulatory frameworks is necessary. And under the conclusion and suggestions, my suggestion is that with the strategic location as the referring country, Bangladesh has the key role to play in successful implementations of with other trans rivers are vibrant and sustainable, sustainable in the sense of economical, environment, environmental, human, social, all point of it has to be sustainable. Then only it can comp compete with railroad. Growth of Indian inland navigation, particularly in the northern and eastern areas, depends on the success of PIWTT. That's a protocol. Therefore, early settlements of the all bilateral issues between the government, both the governments, such as the water settings from Harakavare, Tista River agreements, maritime boundary issues are to be settled. And for that, the end of the hours will be the Consistent political will, bilateral trade cooperation, mutual interest and trust of all the countries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Dandapat. Uh, once again, very detailed and interesting uh, collection of data and your area of work. Uh, it's quite revealing for people like us from the deep sea who have not had the awareness of uh, such detailed work going on in the inland waterway system. Uh, so very glad to get so many inputs from you. Uh, we will discuss the uh, collated points at the end of the session. So now I will uh, ask uh, Captain Kostov Datta to uh, introduce Captain Indravir Solanki so that he can uh, go ahead with his presentation on Agumati of waterways. Maneuvering perspectives. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Dandapat, if you can kindly stop sharing the screen. Okay, the last uh, 
paper for today is augmenting capacity of waterways maneuvering perspective by captain innervir solanki captain innervir solanki is a master mariner with post graduation degree in maritime affairs from world maritime university malmo sweden he has commanded ocean going ships for 10 years he worked for 15 years as a vice president applied research international private limited and led the development of human resources for the merchant marine and inland waterways transportation service a sector he has assisted state governments iwai government of india in drafting rules regulations and policies for iwt sector from 2014 to 2019 he was senior consultant jal mark vikas project iwai world bank for augmentation of capacity of ganga bhagirathi river system that is national waterways one iwai at present he is a consultant to mitsui sk lines japan and param mitra coal resources indonesia for inland waterways transportation he is also the honorary chairman of the nautical institute north and east india branch a member of society of naval architecture and marine engineering usa and associate member of the insurance institute of india over to you captain solanki for your presentation thank you thank you captain datta for the introduction uh, respected seniors uh, panelists fellow seafarers and dear students good afternoon to you all uh, at the outset i would like to thank uh, imer and uh, cmmi for giving me the opportunity to present my paper uh, augmentation of inland waterway capacity uh, maneuvering perspective i would like to share a presentation and uh, start yes sir yes sir host you can uh, you can start sharing sir you are the co host can you see my presentation uh, yes sir okay thank you uh, basically we uh, when we look at the advantages of inland waterways it is a most sustainable mode of transport uh, with regard regards to efficiency we know that it is fuel efficient uh, when we compare it on ton kilometer basis not on uh, od pair basis because on od pair the the distances vary for example the distance between uh, calcutta to varanasi is about 1300 plus by waterway whereas uh, by road it is about uh, uh, 700 km so therefore there is a dif difference between the od uh, pair efficiency as compared to waterway efficiency then uh, it is environment friendly uh, we know that uh, it is le least polluting in terms of uh, air pollution and water pollution also uh, it also gives an advantage of flood flood protection because by flood pro protection what we are doing is when we increase the capacity of the waterway uh, by dredging the capacity of holding water also increases so that in turn also it deepens the uh, river bed because of which the river does not overflows its banks or overflows the uh, canal bank so therefore Uh, it also assists in uh, flood protection uh, oxygen uh, oxygenation of water also improves because of uh, movement of vessels so that also as uh, you can say the study shows about 10% improvement in oxygen in water by uh, churning the water it uh, minimum number of people are displaced uh, because there is hardly any land acquisition and also minimum number of accidents so you can say with regards to the topic of the day uh, of the seminar so sustainability so waterway is a sustainable mode of transport now when we look at the capacity of the waterway the capacity of the waterway is measured in terms of uh, when we talk of freight capacity it is measured in ton uh, ton kilometer basis so when we say ton kilometer so what we can calculate is 10 km per vessel and the number of vessels that are moving the cargo 
so what becomes very important is uh, that if we if, if we increase the capacity of the vessel for a particular waterway the overall capacity of the waterway will improve so the focus of my presentation is that we need to improve the capacity of the uh, of the vessel for any given waterway how that can be improved so that when we improve the capacity of the vessel for a particular waterway that means the size increases no, 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 the size I, the efficiency no, will I further increase and uh, also uh, what will increase is the total carrying capacity of the vessel and the cost will also come down with that uh, when we look at the operational capacity of the waterway the operational capacity of the waterway is de uh, determined by different factors uh, mainly you can say the dimension of the waterway uh, in terms of uh, uh, available depth in terms of width of the waterway bend radius uh, vertical clearance uh, horizontal clearance and uh, the current in the river whether it is river type of waterway or it is a canal type of waterway and then uh, the traffic rules in certain uh, where we have one way traffic or two way traffic uh, so all these govern the operational capacity of the waterway so the operational capacity is determined by you can say the number of vessels or the number of traffic moves uh, through a particular cross section per, per unit time so it will in some cases it will be determined by determined by the locks like a lock or a constrained uh, cross section so that is the operational capacity of the waterway now why we need to uh, what are the advantages of augmenting capacity of a vessel so it will improve the efficiency of the inland water transportation system that means the advantage of economy of scale from 1.4 ton kilometer to 0.54 ton kilometer if we see the sizes of vessels over period of time has improved whether it is uh, uh, european waterway or china in china for example the average size of vessel was earlier within 500 uh, tons which presently is about 1500 ton so that is what is uh, uh, is important as far as india is concerned we are still uh, with the same capacities of about 500 ton vessel or maximum 1000 ton vessel so that is why it is important that we increase the capacity of the vessel how the uh, capacity can be increased is by designing a vessel which is optimal for the particular waterway that means it is fit for a particular waterway and uh, in terms of when we design the vessel the maximum length of vessel that has been sailing on national waterway 1 is 81 meter at present whereas theoretically if you look at all the dimensions and if we compare the regulations uh, or rather guidelines by piank or rws uh, netherland or by us so then we will find that it is possible to navigate the uh, uh, the existing waterway itself with longer length vessel up to 110 meter at least So now how it is possible uh, the piank has recently designed a concept which is basically a three stage concept whereby uh, initially the design is made uh, design of the waterway is made based on uh, uh, you can say existing uh, dimensions of the waterway which are in terms of width of the waterway bend radius the uh, vertical clearance and horizontal clearance as well as the type of waterway so based on that one can say okay theoretically this type of vessel or this size of the vessel is possible to be navigated through this uh, particular waterway then uh, this concept needs to be you can say checked by the practitioners so whereby the operators uh, you can say a stakeholders meeting is called and one to one discussions are held by the operators what difficulty the masters are facing so that is the second uh, method the third method uh, the the third stage is the detailed design that means one actually designs a vessel of that particular dimension and uh, then does simulation of uh, the waterway and vessel together so that one can say okay now this vessel is actually optimally suitable for that particular waterway and what also becomes important is that what sort of ease with which the vessel can navigate through that particular waterway so that is actually determined by you can say the navigability of the vessel the waterway and environment that means 
what is the current in that waterway what is the wind pattern of the waterway what is the uh, training of the human resource how they have been trained so based on that what can be done is the vessel size can be increased depending on for example if uh, in our waterway national waterway 1 the 300 meter bend radius is a restrict uh, restriction on national waterway 1 now presently as i told that 81 meter length maximum length of vessel uh, inland vessel beki has sailed through that waterway and uh, there is now you can say in iwi or in the industry the hesitancy of increasing the length of the vessel because the, the of uh, maneuverability now why it is so is because we do not have maneuverable vessel we have not actually invested in the maneuvering system or in the research of maneuvering requirement of inland vessels so that actually needs to be done and that is what the research i am actually conducting on now if we compare the radius of turn requirement will be twice the length for a well equipped vessel which mean, means which can be navigated well whereas uh, it will be 3l for a vessel which is you can say uh, less which has got lesser equipment and our existing vessel which are there is 4l so which means we will be able to uh, do about 75 meter length of vessel with the you can say just if i look at the theoretical uh, concepts uh, now coming to the next is uh, in case of classification of waterway when we look at different waterways when i want to say that okay specific waterway how do we specify the waterway so waterways have been specified or classified by Uh, european union china russia or us based on the vessel sizes whereas in our case we have not actually specified vessel sizes we have only classified based on basically type of waterway whether it is riverine or canal type of uh, vessel that means it is self propelled vessel or a convoy then width at the bottom of the channel horizontal and vertical clearance and bend radius uh, whereas the sizes have been mentioned are only approximate and uh, no research or of any kind has been done when we have arrived at these numbers which means that the guidelines which we are giving or the indication which we are giving is itself restricting the ship builders or the vessel owners to operate vessels of uh, you can say optimal size in our waterway if we look at the, an example if the inland vessel beki with the with present dimensions will be able to carry uh, 1900 metric tons uh, 900 is wrongly typed it is 1900 metric tons whereas a vessel of under 10 meter by 12 meter by 2.5 meter can carry 2260 metric tons for the same uh, cost in fact if we increase the beam this can increase to 2600 metric ton so that is where we are increasing the capacity and 360 ton is 20% per trip so which means we are increasing the capacity of uh, the vessel by which we can carry more and the cost can be reduced now what we need to do to do that so what we need to do is actually we have uh, to Im improve our maneuverability of the vessels by uh, setting up criteria for testing and trial of inland vessels i'll come uh, so basically what has been done is uh, what is the requirement of the waterway so we need to know that what is the requirement based on the requirement of the waterway then we come to the maneuverability of uh, inland vessels now the requirement is rounding of bends sharp alteration stopping because in uh, certain waterway there may be restriction around the bend not possible also to give way, give way to a vessel which is coming downstream so in that case the upstream vessel would have to hold on so the stopping backing steaming with current and steaming against current then uh, as in some cases like uh, most of the time in seminars when i say that the number of inland vessels are very few so then people say that we have vessels available in goa but vessels available in, in goa are, are only suitable for goa waterways because they carry downstream cargo they don't need uh, to up uh, go upstream they go upstream but not with cargo also with lesser current if i compare with national waterway 1 where uh, there is always 
a current of roughly about you can say two knots uh, existing uh, so there is need for more power so that is why it is not suitable uh, birthing and birthing now these are self uh, the vessels have to birth on their own there is no tug assistance given cross traffic and local traffic so these are the navigation requirement now the inland vessel a uh, lot of maneuvering studies have been done for sea going vessel but no maneuvering studies or limited maneuvering studies have been done for inland vessels or the, that maneuverability has been improved in case of india if i give you an example the about 70% of our vessels um, which are operating on national waterway one basically ibp route which is presently mainly bangladesh vessels are having only single rudder and these rudders are also plate rudders they are not uh, you can say this uh, rudders designed for inland uh, waterways so therefore there is actually in the existing uh, system itself if we improve the rudder itself not going in for costly thrusters or cot nozzle etc still we will be able to improve maneuverability which will also improve safety of the uh, vessels and the waterway now let us see the requirement inland vessel is operating mostly in confined waters as compared to sea going vessel mostly in open waters and when it comes in restricted waters it has got assistance of tugs limited long straight course steaming for inland vessel because most of the rivers in our case in india are you can say uh, mm, 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 with bends etc so therefore little or limited long straight course sailing mostly in flows and currents the inland vessel operates in that whereas in case of uh, sea going vessels it will come only when it comes in ports it will have uh, to face heavy air currents or in, in certain states frequent shallow effects whereas in case of sea going vessel shallow effects when it, it it is affected by then it has got tug assistance regular traffic there it is limited traffic regular berthing and berthing which is non assisted and in in winter we get uh, in uh, and w1 we get fog and mist so therefore there is actually more study requirement for inland vessel with regards to maneuverability so and if you look at no tests are conducted for maneuverability of inland vessel sector in india there is no test which is prescribed by any of the uh, uh, state for testing the maneuverability of the vessel or uh, uh, you can say minimum uh, speeds except that uh, uh, you can say the vessel should be able to navigate uh, for example a 6 knot vessel or 7 knot vessel is allowed to sail on any waterway in west bengal and no standard criteria or test requirement across the world for inland vessel there are criteria for defined by uh, different organizations like uh, uh, piank or eu or uh, rain uh, they they have criteria but there is no standard requirement these are requirements specific Uh, set by different country like china also has got uh, uh, maneuverability criteria and test requirement so, uh, us has got but there is nothing standard like in case of sea going vessel we have imo standards so there is need for actually developing maneuverability uh, test and navigation test for uh, inland vessel now sea going vessel we have the requirement of inherent dynamic stability which is important for you can say state uh, sailing or requirement for autopilot then course keeping ability then initial turning and course changing ability your checking ability and turning ability as well as stopping ability and with that there is a basically test how that will be tested is specified by imo and the vessels have to be tested for that similarly navigation test and maneuverability has been specified by uh, chinese class whereby the, uh, they are talking of uh, course keeping ability initial turning and course changing ability yo checking ability turning ability stopping quality and going astern ability and they are uh, these are the requirements which are given for different type of vessel they have got different class of vessels and in uh, you can say different uh, environment in which they are operating according to that they have specified the uh, but in our case in india there is no such requirement uh, these are the requirements by uh, rain uh, uh, society so what they have done is inherent dynamic uh, stability that is not required course keeping ability is required initial turning ability 
your checking ability, turning capacity, stopping ability, speed ahead and stern has been specified. Now, what we what we need is in case of India also, if we look at the Chinese requirements, so these requirements are actually matching with the requirement of India because uh, uh, we have a river and waterway and same is the, the case in case of China. Whereas in case of Europe, it is mainly because their uh, waterways are more straighter and canalized as well as uh, uh, you can say they've been uh, the currents is comparatively uh, low in their waterways. Whereas in case of China, it is you can say very similar to our waterways. Uh, in, what we need to do for uh, making our requirements is that uh, uh, we have, you can say, constrained dimensions to maximize the cargo. Depth, uh, draft and depth constraints have to be taken into consideration because in our case, what we are doing is we have limited depth. We are talking of a riverine waterway where to maintain 2.5 meter or 3 meter depth is a, a very hard bargain. A lot of dredging is required. So therefore, in ca our case, we will be operating vessels in actually very, very shallow waters where when we go to very shallow waters, uh, there are, you can say, critical speed uh, issues. There are also stalling, stalling of rudder issues also because as the uh, depth to draft ratio in re reduces, the stalling happens much earlier. The effectiveness of the rudder actually re reduces. So what we need to actually have for inland vessel is effective rudder not necessarily an efficient rudder. When we say effective rudder, effective means it should be able to, or I should be able to change course. I must be able to round a bend. Efficiency is to more to do with resistance. That means the drag resistance must be less. So in case of efficiency, I have to draw a balance between, uh, you can say, uh, drag and lift. But whereas in case of inland vessels, I have to have more control of an, a vessel as compared to efficiency. So effectiveness has to be looked at when we're talking of inland vessel. So you can say that's why better speed control, I should be able to stop. Autopilot uh, inland vessels, we don't use. Tighter turning capacity is required. Your control even at slow speed is required. Then course changing ability and quick backing and acceleration requirement is also there. So that is what is the requirement against which we need to draw a criteria for maneuverability tests for uh, inland vessels in India. So what is basically my, the, what is suggested here is that we must have initial turning and course changing ability, your checking ability requirement, turning capacity requirement, stopping ability requirement, speed ahead and stern requirement, critical speed requirement. The critical speed of the vessels must be actually uh, calculated and if possible to be uh, you can say uh, found out by using CFD mechanism. Shallow water tests have to be also conducted uh, through R&D and then if a uh, master knows, for example, uh, practically I have experienced that in some cases when the uh, HT ratio drops below 1.5, no matter how much RPM you increase, the speed does not increase. The speed remains same because uh, the it has reached the critical speed. Same thing in case of turn. I'm trying to turn a vessel, giving hard, but not able to, uh, you can say the vessel does not respond. So that is actually due to the uh, shallow water, which are actually shallower than what is theoretically considered. Now look at, uh, uh, I did a research on the vessels which are presently uh, applying on IBP or National Waterway 1. You find that, uh, as I said, that about 70% of the vessels are uh, single uh, rudder. And these rudders are also plate rudder. Now, the plate rudder is actually only efficient with 5 degrees of helm. Whereas in case of uh, inland vessels, we have to give regular helm more than 15 degrees. So normally you can find that for a seagoing vessel, the maximum helm when it is actually in operations, other than when it is uh, you can say in harbors, etc., it is 15 degrees. Whereas in case of inland vessels, it is regularly we are giving hard helms to round bends, etc. So therefore, the flat flat plate rudder is not suitable for inland uh, inland waterways. Similarly, fishtail rudder is considered 
theoretically it has been considered very effective but there are limited experiments on the fish tail rudder and the research results are actually not available to public so therefore uh, there again a research area for fish tail rudders for inland water transportation rudder area in inland vessel it gets limited due to actually limited draft so that also when we look at the length uh, length uh, you can say rudder area as compared to length by draft of the vessel so we find that in case of india uh, indian vessel and bangladesh vessel this ratio is very low whereas it need to be high uh, to you can say about 3 whereas it is comparatively lower than 2 so therefore again uh, there is need to uh, do research on maneuverability and the rudder rudder systems so that we can actually come out with solution which is suitable for our waterways okay captain solanki i will request to sum up yes i am topic. just coming to my what research work has been done till now the research is actually continuing on waterways where the equipment has been put on vessels uh, four vessels have been already actually the uh, data has been collected after initially you can say after desktop analysis and uh, google earth as well as self navigating on the waterway so i have identified three critical bends around which these vessels once the maneuverability is tested in open waters and deep and shallow waters then these vessels will be actually navigated through certain bends so that we understand what is the uh, other requirement of uh, uh, maneuverability uh, national waterway one we know the uh, limitation of the waterway now uh, what what has been done for data collection is the gps uh, the eco sounder is is been is being used agdis is being used gps that is codan and gps compass because most of the inland vessels do not have a uh, compass they have a magnetic compass which is again just like a boat compass what we have so what has been used in the research is a gps compass uh, uh, which gives fairly good accuracy of about 0.5 degree heading and uh, the area because one of the other concern was where i do shallow water test so actually the area between uh, you can say nurpur and diamond harbor has been identified that is where i have done the test because uh, that's a large area and during tide uh, during low tide it is possible to get shallow waters and it is actually even if a vessel ra- runs aground uh, it will be you can say a float with the uh, ri- rising tide so that only problem is that i have to wait only for the, the test has to be done during the slack waters so that is what uh, uh, has been done now the vessel which has been tested is an aran tagore vessel which is iwi vessel and the turning etc uh, has been done initial turning time the zigzag turns have been done turning circle has been done and this has been done both upstream and downstream and uh, this is just a snapshot because the time was less so that's how i put in here you can see the uh, turning circle uh, to starboard when it has been done uh, upstream is just a very small loop at the bottom when uh, whereas in case of uh, with the current the decrease you can say the current reducing this is done during when the uh, water uh, you can say is changing from it is getting slack and then uh, you see the num- turning circle to port the the current uh, is reduced there and subsequently turning circle to starboard is almost at slack water so so that is how the test Uh, these are the test results on agdis which is shown this has been captured in digital format which actually uh, uh, gets uh, printed and then analyzed or we can say analyze through excel and the software uh, what i have developed now what it says is the turning circle in shallow water the so far result is uh, when the h uh, that is the depth to draft ratio is 1.5 is appreciably high, higher that is or larger that is about 20% larger and uh, this also matches with the research which has been done in germany for doing a particular vessel so in the, their case it is uh, you can say it is comparatively slightly less about 15% increment is shown there but uh, once we uh, do these trials or tests in narrow bends or uh, where in more 
shallow water the result will be you can say probably uh, more alarming and then we will definitely need to do uh, more our maneuvering then the turning circle we can see the turning circle upstream and downstream how it is different the rate of turn also varies because this is also most of the time we are taught or we are we considered that the rate of turn is independent of uh, uh, you can say current but the rate of turn varies because when we are talking of turning upstream because when the vessel is actually uh, the turning capability of the rudder is dependent on angle of attack now the angle of attack changes when i am uh, doing upstream or downstream because of uh, you can say uh, the profile of the vessel or when the vessel is turning during that and that results in actually uh, inefficiencies in the maneuvering uh, the way forward is analysis of critical bends on the waterways which has been done for national waterway 1 up between calcutta to farakka then uh, we need to use three step method for vessel dimensions to fix accordingly that means as i said that initially theoretical concept then practice that means discuss what are the issues how these issues can be actually uh, uh, taken care of by improving the maneuvering system or whatever the issues are how the solutions can be done and then doing a simulation of uh, that vessel for particular that stretch of the waterway where the difficulties are then criteria for maneuvering of inland vessels at least the classification societies should come with a guideline it may not be a regulation initially but a guideline so that at least the ship builders start to think in in those terms or the designers start to think that we have to also consider maneuverability of these vessels which was ignored so so far then study, study of rudders the type of rudder because in sea going we use naka rudder now the naka rudder design is an expensive design we can design our own uh, uh, or we can use our own rudders Uh, by a fish tail because the, uh, these are small vessel which can be beast and the rudder can be changed and we can do research our own in house research may be able to give us a, a better type of rudder then ducted twin propellers have shown that it increases the thrust by thrust thrust efficiency by over 10% and also the rudder efficiency by you can say equivalent percentage so that also we need to actually think of uh, putting uh you can say ducted uh, rudders or ducted uh, twin propellers two rudders behind each propeller maybe uh, because we have to increase the rudder area what we are using is single rudder so instead of that we can use twin rudder and see how the efficiency of these vessels improve then bow thruster in case of when we want to go really for long vessels if required if the simulation results uh, show otherwise then we may be able to uh, have a vessel which is uh, which needs to have a bow thruster so the way ahead is we need to adopt uh, requirements of uh, speed maneuverability and uh, analyze and then if required do modification or a construct a vessel iwi has got uh, 14 special designs which are there on website they were to construct a vessel but they have not constructed a vessel so they need to actually uh, invest in construction of vessel which has been designed for national waterway 1 and see how it response to our waterway because the capacity the carrying capacity is larger it will be more efficient and more efficiency only will bring actually cargo to the waterway it has to because in case of inland water system we have to understand it is not similar to sea carriage here we are talking of in case of sea carriage or sea freight the comparison is between vessels and companies here the comparison is with road and rail which are our competitor so in in this case we have to ensure that the cost of transportation is competitive to road and rail so that is what we have to actually work towards if we want the waterway to be functional and uh, then once all this is done then we should think of regulating and putting regulation in place not start with regulation first and then you know we start thinking and breaking down the regulation with this i thank you very much for paying attention um and being uh, participant to this uh, paper i am open to all questions thank you uh, once again okay uh, thank you very, very much uh, captain solanki once again a very involved uh, detailed uh, study and results of your activities a very uh, eye opening and enlightening for the people who are 
not involved with uh, in uh, inland water transport see the innovation that you are trying out with the uh, design changes and uh, small in uh, innovations that could make the difference from what where you, we are and where we want to go so would we take that questions first kostav uh, from there are uh, see, we are already overrun by 15 minutes yeah. uh, for the validity yeah. session so i will we can we have two or three questions couple of questions in the chat box i will just read out it is addressed for to captain solanki by captain y sharma uh, he is asking what is the average speed that iv vessels iv vessels can achieve upstream and downstream in national waterways one then uh, what is the transit time from haldia to varanasi and what are the bunkering facilities on national waterways one okay the first uh, is actually these vessels are most of the vessels in inland uh, uh, inland vessels have been designed for 8 knots in calm weather so and they achieve uh, upstream uh, it varies between season so they achieve a speed of about varying between 5 to 8 kilometers when going upstream the downstream speed would be in the range of 10 to 15 kilometers so that is the average speed that means upstream will be between 5 to uh maximum 10 km uh, for a very few vessels will achieve 10 km otherwise it will be 5 to 8 km and downstream it will be between 10 km to 15 km that is the downstream average speed the transit time to varanasi uh, going upstream will be uh, for a vessel on aran tagore which uh, i have gone twice on that vessel so that is basically about uh, it took us uh, 10 days and downstream it Uh, took us seven days. So that is the present and uh, transit time. Actually, uh, there are different. Uh, why the transit time is uh, uh, higher is because of uh, there are pontoon bridges. Uh, a bit, uh, you can say the between uh, uh, Patna, rather uh, between Bhagalpur to Varanasi, and these pontoon bridges take time to open. And certain cases, uh, it can be open only at night. So therefore, the transit time is comparatively it increases by. couple of days because of that and uh, what was the third question the, the what are the bunkering facilities on national bunkering Park? facility uh, presently what uh, there is a bunkering facility at uh, patna iwt terminal otherwise what we use is actually a 20 uh, 20 ton uh, tanker so that is ordered and then we take bunkers with that mostly we bunker at farakka because farakka log is there so uh, which is sufficient to uh once we take bunker at farakka it can actually do navigation uh, go to varanasi and come back uh, to farakka with uh, without uh, having to rebunker okay the next question is also addressed to captain solanki from pralay kumar bhattacharya that if we have vessels as per requirement will it be possible to run in land what vessels efficiently and safely with existing manpower Uh, exist no the manpower needs to be trained actually speaking we have uh, 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 i would like to uh, say here that though uh, we have night navigation facility but it this facility is not suitable for night navigation night navigation facility exists but uh, there are uh, it is not suitable that means does not give master confidence for night navigation but what has happened is that were a good thing what has happened is that the river information system has been developed which is a uh, more or less you can say agdis based system and the masters need to be trained to use this agdis that means electronic method like uh, taxi driver when they go from place a to b they use a gps map similarly the agdis can, is to be used in inland vessel because the waterway uh, uh, the channel it, itself shifts in certain cases and the depth uh, may not, where one is available may not be available the next time so therefore uh, and uh, barely 5% of the masters would be able to use the river information system which is uh, you can say put on vessels or is available so there is need for training in, in uh, requirement is there uh, but okay. first the equipment has to be put on vessel because presently the equipment is expensive and the Uh, vessel operators are not putting the equipment so that is one and once the equipment is put then the training of use of that equipment has to be done because that will actually improve efficiency of the waterway system because night navigation will be possible 
okay thank you thank you captain solanki i uh, will conclude the session with the summing up by the chair captain banerji uh, please sum it up and conclude the session uh, yes uh, uh, just a few points uh, captain uh, subedar uh, he has uh, shared his vast experience starting from the escape strategy of 2017 Uh, what i gather uh, is a common uh, refrain on all the participants uh, since yesterday that uh, we are unable to convert our ideas to execution so we have lot of ideas we are at it and uh, uh, he has been at it for many uh, long time but uh, despite it being cheaper uh, the first mile and the last mile connectivity the initiative required is not just making it happen so the common cause between the cargo interests and ship owners is not giving the desired synergy so benefits uh, which should actually promote the ship owners to commit more assets to this inland waterway is not happening uh, we have a lot of procedures as he said about customs and immigration in inland waterway what is the purpose but that also brings in extra cost time so somehow the protocols are far too many Uh, for a smooth transition inland waterways uh now from the uh, uh, presentation from mr dapat uh, very nice history of the trade that existed before india was independent uh, with bangladesh and then the uh, disruption in the waterways uh, services Uh, here the interesting point that i observed was that uh, we started with the 55 45 deployment of asset vessel assets from india in the beginning we just come down to 4% and 95.5% in favor of bangladesh so obviously bangladesh has been able to exploit the opportunities much better than uh, indian side uh, for whatever reasons the stability of operations from indian side has not happened uh, we have had lot of uh, uh, opportunities coming up with the bbi and cooperation asian active east policy but uh, in every sphere uh, looks like the ready made garment and other products that bangladesh is using the inland waterways uh, much better than us and maybe we should be uh, learning something from them significant scope of growth of cargo movement is there but there are equally uh, constraints and challenges a uh, lot of projects in the pipeline a lot of things to look forward to but again the last word that he said was simplification and rationalization unless this happened the common folks cannot come into this picture uh, as you say the next uh, topic also captain indravish he said that the technology they are working upon researching upon but once the technology is ready the user end user to actually navigate these vessels in the what you need training and uh, commitment of further resources so improving capacity of waterways to take the cargo share from the rail and road that is the challenge uh the improvement of the design augmentation from uh, 500 metric ton carriage to 1500 metric ton that uh, china has achieved uh, we can work on those because as you said the uh, conditions of china and india river line systems are similar uh validation of the design by actual operators and stakeholders it's also is uh, again a cross cross operation uh, or rather the scenario deep sea and coastal trade and inland waterways remains the same maneuvering requirements of inland water vessels classification vessels to give some guideline i see the draft is 2 point uh, the uh, vessels are working at power design mismatch between different waterways so the goa vessels cannot be used in the other waterways so very informative a uh, lot of learning lot of work to do so it has been a very very uh, informative and uh, enlightening session i hope for all of us as it has been for me thank you very much thank you captain banerji over to you badnagar sir for the validatory session uh uh good evening everyone uh, may i request uh, mr abhijit banerji to uh, to take for take it forward the validatory session you have to unmute yourself first right at the bottom if you scroll the okay uh, yeah I, i think i'm unmuted can you hear me 
yes yes, yes. okay fine uh good e- good afternoon everyone uh so i will be taking up the concluding session of this three day seminar and we are running out of time so i'll try to be as brief as possible uh first uh, it has fallen upon me to announce the prize winners of the student session paper competition the first prize goes to mr shri wagmare and these are also just uh, coming from uh, uh, mmd apparently they had a hard time choosing the winners and the pri- uh, who to give the prize to and not not to the second prize goes to mr mohammed abir mahadi mr mohammed abir mahadi the third prize goes to mr jawad zulkarnain mohammed mr jawad zulkarnain mohammed however i am told all others are also very close finishers and it was a very difficult choice to make so a big hand to all of them the next item is uh, the summarizing of the conference proceedings i'll be very brief because uh, after every session very expert people have made their own summations but i'll just go through the three day proceedings uh, very briefly for the inaugural session we saw is coach uh, is coach 2020 chairman mr amitabh banerji welcoming all delegates to the conference and the conference was then inaugurated by mr karan paul chairman of apj shipping limited and of the apj surendra group mr paul spoke briefly about economical and environmental sustainability going hand in hand and about future gender equality in crew opportunities the isco 2020 souvenir was released on mr paul's behalf by captain r narasimhan ceo of apg shipping limited captain b k jha master cmmi and mr uday purohit president imei expressed their happiness at this joint venture by cmmi and imei especially in this time of covid-19 convener mr amit bhatnagar informed there were 25 papers in all that had been selected for presentation at the conference then co convener captain kostub datta informed that the topics of the papers covered a wide range of maritime field so briefly that was the inaugural session we come to session 1 that was on the 27th mr arun sharma spoke on maritime sustainability in general he said it will depend on a fine balance between the economic environment and social aspects in the future we will see a smart ship smart fleet and a smart model efficient in terms of delivery environment and cost then mr jagmeet makkar spoke on maritime education need for cross functional approach all functions to work together and be ready for further skills that is the guideline for the or motto for the future then rear admiral nk mishra spoke on towards ship building 4.0 and indian perspective and that was a very detailed discussion i am being very brief here then dr bk saxena spoke on future of maritime education and training for maritime sustainability curriculum needs to be dynamic to meet the technological advancements It, it is important to identify what is ch- changing and what will be changing in future the process of change needs to start from top and to involve every layer then mr sujay bog spoke on maritime sustainability global opportunities again in general he stressed on environment sustainability and gender equality and also stressed on uh, inland waterways development for this sustainability session 2 yesterday 
Captain Vinod Naveen spoke on digitalization and blockchain and its applicability in future shipping. Mr. Karan Doshi and Mr. Apurva Ranjan Kar spoke on remote surveys, the past, the present, and the future, deliberating on the advantages, shortcomings, complexities, and challenges concerning the same. Then Mr. K. Josiah Joseph, Mr. C. Anupa Prasad, and Mr. R. Venkatesan, speaking on sustainable ocean observation towards an ocean-based blue economy, narrated a study of mode boy observations of Chennai in delineating the, or delineating the variability of the state of the sea. Very interesting study there. Session three yesterday. First, Captain Devashis Basu speaking on using gamification in maritime training. Talked about using games to enhance the skills and confidence level of seafarers. Then Mr. Jagmeet Makkar coming in once again, speaking on cropping of propeller blades, effect on engine performance and torsional vibrations, a case study. Discussed an actual case where cracks had appeared and measures were taken, even as the vessel was under commercial press pressure from the office and the charterers to sail. So that was an interesting story. Then Mr. Sunil Peter speaking on development of new shipbuilding and repair facilities in the East Coast, factors and challenges narrated the history of shipbuilding on the East Coast and talked about the present ventures in the field undertaken by Cochin Shipyard Limited in the region. Session four. Once again, Mr. Jagmeet Makkar speak, coming in, speaking on charter party disputes and prevention, speed and consumption claims, very relevant. Discussed the basic concepts regarding the matter and ways to minimize or avoid claims on this count. Then Captain Jitendra Kampani speaking on elements of international trade and business development, discussed how knowledge of the basic aspects of commerce and trade could help seafarers and others also to become entrepreneurs. Then Captain Dev Narayan Goswami speaking on cost of injury in the world of captured regulation talked about how to lessen the risk of accidents and get a better return on investments by ship owners or operators with reference to flag and class inspections. Session five, that was today. Captain Bidhut Kumar Banerjee speaking on safety in shipping. It could be worthwhile to have. Discussed factors contributing to accidents and ways of preventing them. Then Mr. Pradlai Kumar Bhattacharya speaking on security threats and impact on maritime sustainability, shared information on different types of security threats to ships together with statistical data and case examples. Mr. R. Sinirva speaking on implementation of cyber risk management in a shipyard, identify key challenges, identified key challenges and methodologies in the background of cyber attacks. Very relevant topic. Session six, which is the cadet session, the student session. Uh, cadet Sri Wagmare was the winner of the prize, first prize, spoke on what in water, energy from the oceans to propel ships. Then Cadet Ansh Bhatnagar spoke on future of shipping and underwater research, hybrid underwater vehicle. Cadet Shomik Dutta spoke on study of hydrodynamic coefficient and motion nature due to the shape change of floating objects. Cadet Jawad Zulkarnain Mohammed spoke on a competitive study on the resistance of KCL, KCS and JBC hull for determination of optimal ship speed. Cadet Ayush Sharma spoke on maritime sector, a compass to the vision of Atma Nirbhar Bharat. 
Lastly, Cadet Mohammed Abir Mahdi spoke on a study on motion sickness incidents at several positions of a ship in irregular waves. Very interesting study. Session seven, that is the preceding session today. Captain S. Subadar, speaking on inland water transport, discussed the present issues facing this sector and the opportunities and challenges ahead in physical and financial terms. Mr. S. Dandapat, speaking on Indo-Bangladesh protocol on inland water trade, elaborated on the various regulations, protocols, agreements, and legalities concerned with the subject. Lastly, Captain Indervir Solanki speaking on augmenting capacity of waterways, maneuvering perspective, discussed present issues on this very relevant subject again. That brings us to the end of the summation. I think we can move on to the vote of thanks. All of you will appreciate that a conference of this nature could not be possible without the blessings, support, and effort from many a person and organization, and especially in this time of pandemic. I shall briefly try to list a few who, are, who were instrumental in the staging of this webinar in no particular order. We would like to thank our chief guest, Mr. Karan Paul, Chairman APJ Surrender Group, and APJ Shipping Limited for inaugurating the event. We would like to thank the Principal Officer of Mercantile Marine Department, Kolkata, for his role in the event. We thank the top management of the Company of Master Mariners of India for their blessings to the event. We thank the top management of the Institute of Marine Engineers India for their keen support to the event. We thank members of the Executive Committee of CMMI Kolkata chapter for agreeing to co-host the event. We thank the members of the executive committee of IMEI Kolkata branch for proposing to co-host the event. We thank the members of the advisory board of ISCO 2020, Mr. Karan Paul, Mr. S. Hajara, Captain M. M. Saggi, and Mr. Arun Sharma. We thank Captain B. K. Jha, Master CMMI. We thank Mr. Uday Purohit, President IMEI. We thank Mr. Amitabha Banerjee, Chairman ISCO 2020, Mr. Am Amit Bhatnagar, Convener ISCO 2020, whose brainchild this conference was, and Captain Kaustuk Dutta, Co-Convener ISCO 2020, for steering the organizational efforts behind this event. We thank all the members of the organizing committee of ISCO 2020 for their untiring work in the last several months putting up the event. We would like to thank the web developers and the online video conferencing platform provider, Zoom. We thank Sailor Today for being our media partner. We thank the International Journal of Advanced Research in Science and Technology, Technology for publishing the proceedings of the conference. We thank all the sponsors and advertisers for their support to the event. We thank all those who hosted, chaired, or anchored the various sessions of the conference. We thank all those who presented papers and participated in the webinar. We thank all delegates and invited guests who attended the conference. We thank all the students and their institutes for participating in the conference. Last but not the least, we thank the countless persons and organizations we have not identified here by name who worked silently behind the scenes for long to make this event a reality. Thank you all. Now we come to the part of the national anthem for the last time in this conference. You can stand up if you want. Uh, we can unmute ourselves. Uh because we are going to sing together. Okay. Mr. Bhattagar, I have a sentence. <laughs> 
I think uh, Banerjee sir, he wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to add one sentence. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, we need to thank Mr. Obhijit Banerjee for standing by us, who has thanked everybody. Uh, whenever there was a tricky area or whenever things were needed to really bail us out and uh, for uh, giving his uh, secret counsel and confidential counsel whenever the need was there. Thank you, Mr. Vijit Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Bhatnagar, sir, last thoughts on the conference? Uh, well, uh, thanks to everyone uh, because everyone has really worked hard uh, for months together, especially during the COVID. And uh, there was a time when we had, uh, you know, some minds uh, coming out and said that, you know, probably we may have to cancel this. But uh, the majority wanted this event to continue. And uh, I'm really glad that we could make it. And it is, uh, though there, there must have been a few occasions where we might have not, you know, fulfilled the expectations of the audience. However, this was a first experience for everyone. Uh, it was not known. I mean, uh, this platform was not known to anyone. Nobody was aware how the things will come out. Yet, I feel that it was uh, a reasonably uh, decent performance uh, the conference has put up to the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. In fact, the company of Master Mariners would also like to thank the Institute of Marine Engineers, Kolkata branch, the CMMI Kolkata chapter, especially. Uh, and we were greatly supported by the CMMI Bombay headquarters and encouraged to carry on with this uh, ISCO conference 2020 in spite of the pandemic. So I would like to thank uh, from CMMI Kolkata chapter, a big thanks to the IMI Kolkata branch for this joint combined effort and for the ISCO conference to be a grand success on a web platform. Thank you, sir. So I would uh, end the meeting now, sir, with permission yes. of the chair. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to all, sir. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye for now.